right, good morning. Let's get started. We delayed for a few minutes. There's a wreck on 121, so please don't give people dirty stairs when they come in a little bit late. It's probably out of their control. So welcome to the first Tarrant County Probate Bar e-filing seminar. Um, it's also our first Arctic seminar of the year. If, uh, if you would all take a moment to please silence your cell phones and any other noise makers that you may have. Just a few announcements before we get started. Um, please remember that the clerk's party is on Thursday of this week, 5 p.m. at Joe T's. I hope to see you all there. We always have a great time. If you need anything, uh, refreshments are across the hall. We have coffee, pastries, soda, water, iced tea. Um, help yourself. We'll have a short break in the middle so you can refresh your glasses when you get a chance. And restrooms are out this way to uh, across the hall, just slightly down the hall. There's also another set of restrooms back by the elevator when we have our break. So let's get started. This year we've had two gifts bestowed upon us by the probate gods, also known as the legislature. Um, we have the estates code, which is going into effect at the beginning of January, and we also have mandatory e-filing that's starting. So we're going to talk about e-filing today. We have a panel of experts assembled to dispel any myths or answer any questions that you may have. We're going to talk with the county clerk's office and with our text file representative first. Um, then we'll hear from our clerk and staff again. We'll take a short break. Then um, our own Judge King will come up and uh, let us know some of the details on how this will work with respect to probate filings. And then we'll have a short question and answer session. So thank you all for being here. And um, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce Mary Louise Garcia. She is our Tarrant County Clerk. She took office on January 1st, 2011 and is ending nearing the end of her first yes. term. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, sorry. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here. I'm just going to do a little housekeeping, and then I'll really turn it over to the expert, Terry Derrick. Um, as you know, in um, December 2012, we got a, an order from the Texas Supreme Court that all attorneys, will, civil attorneys, will be filing. Um, we're one of the larger counties, so we have a mandate to go live January 1st. Kind of the background on this, um, with this mandate in my office, it certainly pushed my office Tom Wilder's office, our IT department, to work more collaboratively together and to spend a lot of time together. And of course, with Tyler Technology, we have spent hundreds of man hours in my office preparing for this, as well as IT, hundreds of man hours in the IT department. And our commissioner's court has to date already spent uh, several hundred thousand dollars out of our general fund with this mandate to make sure we're up and running to take care of you, the attorneys, the best way we can because you are our customers at the end of the day. And I've had plenty of attorneys come in my office and talk about what it's going to cost you to get ready, both hardware and software. So you know, I understand your costs and, and, and understand that we have ours too that we're going to try and, and get past in this general fund to make sure we're successful. Um, you know, we're all in this together. At the end of the day, it's about customer service from my office to you as the attorneys that we do business with. Um, I do want to let you know, kind of underneath the hood, when this project started, I sit in every single meeting, every single IT meeting. I'm the one that's going to help kind of push this thing forward. You know, people get in the weeds. We have a lot of things, technology and stuff, that um, technical things. But just know from my office, when you come in and do business with us, I've been in this project since day one. We're moving things forward. We do spend some money when we have to. We've got new machines for all our clerks that we have in the probate section. Um, and our permissive go live that we decided with Tyler Technologies is December 1st in my office. So we have our permissive go light. Our mandate is January 1st, but we are shooting for that goal. Things are looking good. We've rolled out a new um, upgrade on their software. And... Um, we are here to help you as much as we can. We may not have all the answers. We have put things out on our website that we push the fre frequently asked questions. We're going to take questions from you today. We're going to go back. We're going to get those answers. Um, Judge King is going to speak to you about some of the questions. So let's let Terry come up. He's our program manager. They've done a great job with uh, Tyler Technology. Terry, it's great to partner with you and your staff. Folks, we're here. Arlene Jr. is the one that runs my division. Jimmy Pollitt, I'm sure most of you know, is the manager. Um, so just be patient with us, and we're going to make this happen. I promise you we're going to see this through, and we will be successful. So, Terry, go ahead and come up and tell us a little bit about TextFile. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm introduction, and he hello, everybody. Um, 
first off, I just want to say thank you guys for giving me an opportunity to come and, and speak with you on behalf of the TextFile team here at Tyler. And secondly, thank you guys for actually uh, braving the, the cold weather to actually make it out here this morning. Um, like you said, my name is Terry Derrick. I'm the program manager for TextFile. And what that means is uh, my chief responsibility is to manage a professional services organization with TextFile to really establish the implementation strategy across all 254 counties and the 16 appellate courts that we have here in the state of Texas. And then to see that, uh, that, that strategy be executed upon by, by my staff. Uh, today, what I want to do is go through three different phases with you and talk about three different things. Um, first, just talk about an overview of text file, what text file is. Uh, second, talk about the filing mechanics, how it all works. And then third, talk about the timeline and how it's going to impact you guys here in Tarrant County. So the first thing I want to do is jump right into the overview. Uh, who is TextFile and what is TextFile? So TextFile is the new e-filing manager in the state of Texas. It replaces the previous system that's in existence today. Um, that system is called Texas.gov, and you may be familiar with it. It's run by a company called NIC. So all we're doing is we're replacing that system with the new e-filing manager of TextFile uh, here in the state. Secondly, it's administered by the Office of Court Administration. So the OCA is who our agreement is with. That's different from how the vendor is today in the current existing system. Each agreement is made with each individual county. And so that, that leads a lot of unique circumstances across the state. Um, you can believe that it, all the counties that are out there in the state of Texas don't actually operate in the same exact way. There's unique circumstances on each individual county. So those agreements will vary from county to county. By having our agreement with the Office of Court Administration, they can help steer us and guide us in the direction that's in the best interest for all the counties across the state. And lastly, it's a, it's a company that's powered by a company called Tyler Technologies. So the TextFile business unit is a part of Tyler Technologies. If those of you who are familiar with Tyler Technologies, we've been in the courts and justice industry for over the last 35 years, been able to provide good service, and we focus only on the public sector. So we don't get focused on uh, other companies. We focus only on helping folks out in the public sector. And in fact, our case management system is actually being used in the county clerk's office today, which helps out matters. So we're bringing that same product that we've had, our e-filing system, in nine other states across the, uh, across the country, and we're bringing it here to the state of Texas and rebranding branding it under the TextFile logo. So talk a little bit about e-filing today. And today, it's it, e-filing has been around for a while. It's actually been around since about 2003 here in the state of Texas. Currently, 52 of the 254 counties are using it in some capacity, whether it be with the a, a district court or the, the county courts or, or even the justice courts. At some capacity across those 52 counties, it's being implemented. 10 out of the 16 appellate courts are using it as well. And so even though you've got a small number of counties, uh, about a fifth of the counties here in the state of Texas that are using e-filing, it actually, the makeup of those counties actually equates up to about 80% of the population in the state of Texas. Uh, because those counties that are utilizing it are the bigger counties. Uh, the counties in the major popula populated areas, uh, places like Dallas and Fort Worth and Houston and San Antonio and El Paso and, and so forth. Uh, the interesting thing about that is though, even though 80% of the population has access to utilize e-filing, only about 10% of the folks actually use it. So you've got about a 10% adoption rate in regards to the filing volume. We really think that there's a couple of reasons why you see such a low adoption rate in the e-filing industry today in the current model. And we really think that there's a couple catalysts to change. Number one is the new e-filing system. We think we can help bring up uh, that, that number, that low adoption rate for e-filing by uh, bringing in a system that's compatible, that's statewide, and that can be leveraged in every single single county the same exact way. And then the last part is, is probably the most important, which is the mandate. And of course, whenever somebody issues a mandate, of course, it requires you to comply. And so we think with that uh, two catalysts to change, um, we think that the e-filing is a very good possibility. It is a, a reality here in the state of Texas, and it's coming to us very, very quickly. So what I want to do is just take a moment and talk about the e-filing mandate um, and what the Supreme Court uh, has done and, and issued here in the, the last 12 months. Regarding uh, the Supreme Court mandate, in December of last year, the Supreme Court came out and said that they were going to implement and require um, attorneys and legal professionals to utilize e-filing in all non-criminal pleadings beginning as early as January 1 of next year. 
What they said is that they were going to roll out this implementation strategy in a six-month cadence, starting with the biggest counties, those counties that have a population of 500,000 or more beginning on January 1st of this coming year. That includes the top 10 counties. That's the Harris, the Bear, the Travis, the Tarrant, the Dallas, the Collin, the Denton, the El Paso, the Hidalgo. You guys get the idea. They're the big counties. After that, though, it's going to follow that six-month cadence all the way down until July 1st of 2016. And at that time, then it'll actually go and, and implement the smaller counties. So uh, July 1st of next year, we'll be focusing on those counties that have a population of 200,000 and more. January 1st of 2015, we'll be focused on those that have 100,000 and more. And we'll work all the way down until we get to Loving County that has 82 people. So we'll work our way down. The, the implementation of this, so has to work on both ends of the spectrum. It's got to work at the big Harris County all the way down to the Loving County and work the same exact way in each one of the counties. So how does it all work? Uh, it's going to work very similar to what you may be familiar with today. Uh, for example, the attorneys and legal professionals will uh, prepare their filing documents just like you would today. If you were filing something um, that would require an initial document like an application or maybe an original petition, you would prepare that document just like you would today, except you're going to prepare it in a PDF format. That's why I've got the PDF little emblem up here on the, on the screen. Uh, it's got to be an 8.5 by 11 searchable PDF document, but you'll prepare that document and what you'll do is you'll actually be able to submit that through the EFSP right so an EFSP is just a, an acronym for a, a larger term called an electronic filing service provider these electronic filing service providers are really just websites that can capture the information that you need to submit information to the court and act as the vehicle to get that information to the court and to the clerk so that the clerks can review that so think of it as a website that captures just generic information um, that's specific to that case, but uh, as, as, a, as an overall generic information, things like the county and the office that you're filing in, the case type that you're filing, the parties, the attorneys who's representing them, um, the, the type of document that you're filing, and the actual image of that document as well. These EFSPs are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you can file you know, at, at during normal business hours or at 11 o'clock at night in your pajamas. Once you choose the EFSP that you want to use, you will utilize them as the vehicle. And that point, that EFSP will get that information and pass it to the filing manager, which is text file, that will uh, put it in a queue so that the clerks can review that information. At that point, the clerks will either choose to accept or reject that document. We'll talk about maybe some reasons as to why it may be rejected in a little bit. Um, but what we, what we show is about 99.7% of an acceptance rate. And on these acceptance that we see, once that document is accepted, it actually gets stamped and it actually goes two different directions. One direction is it goes directly into the case management system. So it puts that information into the existing system that the clerks are using today here in the county courts and the county clerk's office here in, in Tarrant County. But it also gives back to the filer that stamped document as well. And so you get a copy of that as soon as it's accepted. Okay. We mentioned EFSPs, electronic filing service providers. I want to kind of just talk a little bit about them. Um, as folks who are going to be filing and utilizing e-filing here in the very near future, you have a choice. Um, the landscape and the current makeup of the EFSPs is that there's 20, 23 organizations that are out there today that have expressed their intent to become one of these EFSPs. Out of them, the six that were previously established and utilized in the existing um, system, the system that's going away here in the near future, um, are still present in today's EFSP landscape. So when you look at this uh, makeup, you've got those six folks, those six entities that will remain and, and be available for you to use. So if you're utilizing e-filing today, you may not see a change if you stick with your same EFSP. If you stick with that same e-filing provider that you're using today, you may not even notice a difference. However, there are 17 new entities that have said, hey, I want to be a part of this whole e-filing deal as well. So in that, though, we've got the list of them up here, and the ones that are bolded are the five that have already become certified. Now, in order for an EFSP entity to be an actual EFSP in the text file program, they've got to go through a certification process. They go through a two-week process that's tested out by the Office of Court Administration. The whole certification is run by the OCA, and they have to pass a rigorous series of tests in order to become that EFSP. 
what they're checking on is to make sure that that information that is submitted to them is actually able to be passed to the clerk's office successfully, and then that information can be passed back successfully. So if you look up here, you've got five that are currently in existence today, File and Serve Express, File Time, My File Runner, ProDoc, and of course, the text file team is bringing their own portal to the state as well. So talking about uh, filing mechanics, how does it all work? Um, what I want to do is walk through an example of an e-filing process regardless of the electronic filing service provider that you choose to utilize. The basic steps in filing a brand new case are pretty similar across the board. But before you can utilize an EFSP, you have to go through a single step that's a one-time step for each EFSP that you choose to use. And that right there is to actually register and get set up with that electronic filing service provider. What you're doing is you're basically getting your user credentials. So if you've ever signed up to have uh, an email account, uh, you're probably going through the same process of putting in some information so that they can identify your username and password so that you can log into the system and use it thereafter. Once you set up that for the first time, then there's a five-step process that goes into play, with the first step being the case information. So you'll fill out information like the location that you're filing, the county, the, the office, you'll, the case type, and then you'll go in and actually say, how am I going to pay for this? And you'll choose uh, typically a credit card that you put on file so that you can actually utilize that to pay for your filings, the same thing that you would pay for if you were paying for it over the counter. The second thing is you put in the parties on that case. Who are the parties on this case and who are the attorneys that are representing them? You also have some additional demographic information that if you have it, you can put it in. The third step is the filings itself. What are you filing? An application, uh, an original petition, a motion, an affidavit? What is it that you're actually filing? And you would then upload that document to that EFSP. Fourth step is an optional step. This is setting up your e-service contacts. So if you want to electronically serve someone, not, not the uh, personal service at the beginning of the case, but uh, afterwards, if you want to electronically serve in any shape, form, or fashion, you can set up those accounts, those contacts, the email addresses that you would want to do. Most attorneys that we've seen, because this is an optional step, uh, you usually just bypass this, come back to it later and set those up as they need to on these case, cases that they have. So a completely optional step to set up these service contacts. The last step is something that you would typically see in anything that you do online. Anytime you're making an order or you're submitting something. If you've ever used Amazon, it kind of follows the same path. At the end, before you actually purchase something, they give you an opportunity to review everything and make sure everything is correct. We do the same thing. Give you an opportunity to verify that all the entry information that you've put in is accurate before you hit that submit button. So once you hit the submit button, then it actually goes into the clerk's queue so that they can review it and then make the appropriate decision on whether to accept it or reject it. The next thing I want to talk about is the cost because that's always a, a, a big point. What I want to do is I want to talk about it in two different shapes. What I want to do is I kind of lay out the cost structure and kind of how it is today versus how it's going to be in the text file system as soon as it comes online. And the second thing I want to do is put it into a scenario format so that it can kind of give you a different perspective and kind of put everything back into a, a level set environment. So the first thing, I've got the Texas.gov emblem up, up at the top, and then underneath that, I've got the text file emblem. And so it's actually broken down by three different cost components. The first one is that electronic filing service provider fee. Now, the EFSPs have their ability to charge whatever it is that they want. As soon as they become certified, they can charge zero dollars, they can charge a billion dollars. It's really at their discretion. Um, what we see in today's makeup of the EFSPs in the Texas.gov environment is it's about three dollars and a quarter to about sixteen and a half dollars per filing. That can be kind of costly if you think about the number of filings that are done on a case record. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But that's denoted here by the black button that's up here um, on the screen. Now, in addition to that, there, there's an e-filing manager charge. So the Texas.gov environment charges you about $10.50 per filing. The way that that's broken down is by two different cost components that aren't depicted up here. It's about $5 for a filing and about $5.50 per electronic service that you do. So assuming you do an electronic service and a filing, you put the two together, and that's how we got the $10.50 per filing. 
After that, there's a county fee that they can charge. Now, this county fee is a cost recovery fee. Now, what this fee really denotes is that each county office has the ability to charge this fee. And what we see across the state is most of them do. The reason being is that this $2 cost recovery allows the clerk's office to recover the cost of implementing an electronic filing system in their office. Things that you would probably think about is like normal servers and kiosks for people who want to actually file while they're in the courtroom or when they're in the clerk's office. That stuff costs money, so the $2 cost recovery allows them to recover the cost of implementing those things to get them up and running. So if you look at it at a holistic standpoint, kind of put it all together, e-filing fees today run about anywhere from $13 up to $29 per filing. That's in the current existing system today. With text file, we feel like we can reduce it pretty substantially, and here's how. The first thing that we'll do is bring our EFSP to the state free of charge. So if you want to use an EFSP that charges, great, you're entitled to do that. And they probably have some services that they offer that warrant that additional cost component. If you want to use a free version, we do have some free versions out there, including the text file EFSP. So your EFSP charge can be as low as $0 to as high as the EFSP that you choose that costs second cost component is e-filing manager. Text file is not going to charge you anything. We're not going to charge you $10.50 per filing. We're going to charge you $0. The, th the third part is that same cost component that's in existence today. It doesn't go away and it's still going to be valid. The county clerk's office here is going to charge. The district clerk's, uh, county, uh, district clerk's office here is going to charge that $2 fee. That's to recover that cost of implementing all the hardware and, and uh, technical pieces that, requ that are required to get this thing up and running here in the county. And then if you look at it at the last part, you can be probably as low as $2. I know it shows zero up here, but with that $2 cost recovery, you'll be paying that $2. But after that, that may be all that you're paying. So you can see how the difference is, is pretty vast. So what I want to do is take a step back now and look at it and put it into a scenario format so that you guys can see it from a different aspect. I want to do the same thing. I want to compare the old version versus the new version so that we can kind of compare apples to apples. Uh, the first part is the case fees. And what I'm using here is just a divorce case. I know you guys don't file divorce cases. I know it's filed in the district clerk's office, but uh, you can put divorce case. You can put anything that you want, a probate case if you want, a guardianship case, whatever it may be. Uh, just level set and put a $275 fee. Um, if you're looking at the case, uh, case costs, those court fees that cost $275, they still exist when we move forward. The only difference is, is House Bill 2302 got passed, and House Bill 2302 actually says that there's going to be an additional $20 fee. It's going to be impactful, and it actually took effect on September 1st of this year. That's regardless of whether you're filing online, utilizing an electronic filing system, or whether you're filing over the counter. So if you've started to file stuff over the counter after September 1st, you may have noticed that additional fee. It's just another fee that the state has, has uh, put on to these cases. So we went ahead and threw that in and said that that's part of the new process, just so that we could level set. So at this point, you've got the old process at 275. You get the new process at about 295. From there, we took into account that on average, you can probably see about 10 filings per case. This is 10 different events, 10 different motions, 10 different affidavits, applications, whatever it may be on a case on average. If you multiply that across how, how much it's going to cost in the old system, we said it's about 13 to 29 dollars times 10. If you look at it in our system, it's about uh, 10 of them times either $2 or upwards to whatever it is that you choose regarding your EFSP. So you can look at a net impact of uh, the old version of being anywhere between $415 up to $565 versus $295 up to $460 per case. Uh, the net delta there is about $115. So you have a pretty substantial cost savings depending upon what you choose to use as your electronic filing service provider and the new EFM, which is text file that's coming to the state for free. Okay. So a good way that you guys can go and get a lot of information about text file is to go out to our website. Our website is www.textfile.com. And this website is the central portal for all news and information. So anytime that we get new uh, information or new news from the state, what we're doing is we're putting it out here. Um, it's also uh, information is listed out here regarding all the different electronic filing service providers that have been certified. So if you're wondering what do these EFSPs do and how do they differ from each other, you can go out to our website and you can click on the links. It'll take you directly to their websites and they'll tell you what their value adds are and how much they cost. 
good way to go in and do a comparison. We're working with the state right now to develop a cost comparison sheet and trying to pr uh, produce that and be able to deliver that before the end of the year to everybody. However, we've got to be very delicate in that because we are one of the EFSPs, so we're really um, pushing it back on the state for them to help uh, develop that list. Uh, the third thing that it does is on this website is it links to pertinent information. So the Judicial Committee of Information Technology, which is uh, the committee that really focuses on technological decisions and feeds that information up to the Supreme Court so that they can make decisions and pass that down to the state, is also a valuable resource. I encourage you guys to go and take a look at the JCIT website. Um, it has a lot of valuable information. We link to that website on our website. So it's a good place as a central hub to go and get a lot of different um, avenues of information. And lastly, it's the point of entry process for the review process. So when the clerks come in and actually review those filings that you've submitted, they can actually get there directly from this screen. Okay. So what does it look like whenever my filings go into the system so that the clerks can review it? That's what this screen is. It may be a little difficult for you guys to see up here, so I apologize for the, the font being so small, but I do want to kind of walk through this screen just real briefly. I, I always think that it's uh, interesting, but it's also valuable for you guys to see what the clerks are seeing on their end. The first thing is in the upper left-hand corner, it shows a petition as a lead document. But if there were additional documents that were filed here, for example, if they filed a motion in addition to that petition, you would see both of them listed there. Now, this is different from the existing system today that only allows you to file one filing per envelope. You can file multiple filings per envelope in the new system. Okay. The second piece is down here, you see all the case information. This is the same information in that five-step process that we walked through a little earlier. What county did you file it in? What office? What case type? Who are the parties? Who are the attorneys? That type of information. In the main working space here, you'll actually see that document. That's the document that would have been uploaded. That would be the document that uh, the clerks would see and review. And they have a bunch of different actions that they can do up here on the upper right-hand side. Things like accepting, uh, rejecting the document, or maybe forwarding it on to another clerk or a judge for their review. Now, we talked about it a little bit earlier and said that there is a high acceptance rate, and it's a 99 point acceptance rate that we see across the country in terms of the documents that come in. Why would you ever see a clerk reject a filing? And I always get this in every one of the presentations that I give. It's not really the clerk's responsibility to uh, deem that that file is, is, is ready for court. Here's some of the reasons that we currently see. Number one is an unsigned document. If you have a document that you submitted to the court but you failed to sign it, um, we, we see a lot of clerks having a business process that says, I will reject that with a reason saying, please sign the document and submit it again. It's important to note that in the current rule set, the slash S slash space followed by your name is an acceptable signature. So you don't have to do an electronic signature. You can utilize that instead. Second thing that we see is an incorrect case number. If you're filing it into case 123, but you put 456 on there, they may reject that and send that back. Where we see this more often than not is not on the case number, but in the wrong county. So think about it for just a second. In the statewide system, you're clicking that drop-down box, and you're choosing a county to choose, right? Instead of Tarrant, you accidentally choose Taylor because it's right after it, and you accidentally file your document into Taylor County. They may reject it and say, hey, this is actually supposed to be going over to Tarrant County instead. The last thing is an incorrect document type. Believe it or not, we do get them, and we do get attorneys who accidentally scan those documents in upside down, and when they do it, you can't read them. So if it gets scanned in as a blank document, it may get rejected, and they may ask you to rescan it back in in the proper format. Okay. So with the introduction to e-filing here in the state, we do have an obligation to work with the clerk's offices to, to talk through their current processes. As it's introduced as an electronic file, either from a, an attorney or a legal professional or either from a pro se litigant, it's introduced into the intake and docketing uh, folks there in the clerk's office. So as they intake that, they're getting that information, much like they're doing today, and they're doing a file stamp. The system's doing that file stamp form, so long were the days of the bonk stamps and then giving back to you. It's done a little differently in the e-filing world. But what that does is the introduction of an electronic document removes that paper from their hands. A lot of times that paper's done to do different things. I'll give an example. When you go in and you file something over the counter today, more than likely you're paying for it. When you're paying for that, they're typically giving you a paper receipt back. So you got to think, does it make sense for us to file something electronically and then have to drive all the way to the clerk's office to go get our receipt? Probably not. 
So even though we're introducing electronic files as an entry point, it, there are several exits to paper, uh, things like the receipts, uh, things like uh, scheduling for hearings that need to go on the docket um, and sending out those notices, uh, things like in-court activity like uh, documents that require judges' signatures and things like that. So there's a lot of different processes that we'll be working with all the counties across the state to walk through those processes to identify where they may want to utilize an electronic format as opposed to a paper format that may be in, in process today. Some counties have said, hey, you know what, we're going to keep going down the paper process. There's nothing wrong with that. But I, I think it is a, a good, valid conversation for us to have with each of the offices to talk about the different opportunities that they have given their case management system when they can utilize electronic processes. What that means to you is that these processes may evolve over time, and as they do, they may change. And so what we'll do is we'll do our best to try to communicate that out to you, make that information readily available, so if processes do change, you can kind of uh, adjust and adapt to them as well. So what we'll be doing over the course of the next several months is working closely uh, with the clerk office here um, on both ends to uh, really kind of collaborate with those judicial partners and come up with those processes where they may want to take advantage of an electronic process as opposed to a paper process. Okay. Uh, one of the things that's really important in this whole, in this whole uh, e-filing mandate is the statewide, statewide e-filing rules. Um, they just originally came out earlier this year. They just went through another form of revision. So this updated version of it, um, of the rules in, uh, of civil and appellate procedures, um, came out. Um, they were uh, really open for comment up until about October 30th. And... Um, a lot of comments have come in. We've actually had an opportunity to get some feedback from the Supreme Court on uh, what some of those comments were. Um, but we're expected to see a final delivery of these. Um, the actual website that, uh, presentation that I have here, this link right here links to those rules. So we'll be able to give you that link at the end of the presentation. Feel free to jump in there and click on it so you don't have to go dig those up. You can get right there. But gives you the latest rules that we've got. Now, the final set of rules is expected to come out sometime in the, in the month of December. And when it does, uh, we're expecting that to take effect on January 1st. So as soon as it becomes mandated, those new rules will come into play. Um, I encourage you guys to go and take a look at these rules. Um, there's a lot of valuable information in there. A lot of the questions that you probably will have today is located in the rule set. So I encourage you guys, um, after the presentation, uh, just go review it and kind of see what it says, uh, see what kind of changes that are, are anticipated in, in the rule set for this upcoming mandate. Last thing I want to talk about today is the timeline. How does it impact here uh, in Tarrant County? In our statewide rollout and the implementation strategy that we've we've developed here for all 254 counties in the 16 appellate courts across the state, there's really two different phases in our our minds. The first phase is. Uh, the courts that are currently filing, those 52 counties that are currently utilizing the system today, when you've got a system that's going offline, you know we've got an obligation to ensure that those counties are actually utilizing this, uh, an e-filing solution and providing them with the same functionality that they have today and, and ensuring that they don't have that lapse in e-filing functionality. So if there are some folks who are currently e-filing, we have an obligation to make sure that they can continue to do so when that, that, that system goes offline. We were originally told that that system would go offline on February 28th of next year, and our agreement with the Office of Court Administration says that we can only start implementing on September 1st of this year. So that gives about a six-month window to get 52 counties live on text file. Um, some things have changed, and uh, the company that is currently running the existing uh, software has come back and said it, it wasn't fin financially prudent for them to stay online until February 28th, so the last day that they're going to stay online is November 30th. So that gave us about three months to get 52 counties live on the system. Right now we've got about 38 um, that are currently live. We actually brought three live today, including three of the appellate courts. So uh, we're working to get those 52 counties live by the end of November, including Tarrant County here. Now, in addition to that, we also have the top 10 counties that have that mandate that comes on January 1st. And lucky for us, those top 10 counties are all utilizing it e-filing in some capacity today, so they fall in this first group. What we're doing is we're going and we're rolling out e-filing. We're moving in the Texas.gov and moving it out. We're moving in the text file system and putting it in place. And what we're doing from there is we're refining those business processes with those judicial, uh, uh, judicial officers and with those uh, judicial committees here in each one of those counties to talk about those electronic processes and how those processes may change over the next three months. 
From there, we've got another set of courts, which is the courts that are, are currently not filing and then how the mandate rolls out by that six-month cadence. And that's the second phase that you see up here, which is a new course that we're really going to start getting engaged with probably sometime around the, the month of March next year and then going all the way till July of 2016. How does that impact uh, here in Tarrant County? Uh, what I did is I threw an example court transition timeline up here. And what you're looking at is we always try to bring courts on earlier than their mandate. What that allows them to do is that allows them to work through their business processes and make sure everything is functioning efficiently before that, that date is required to be used. What it also allows is the filing community to have an opportunity to become familiar with how to use the system if they're not already, and so that when it does become a mandate, then they actually are familiar with that process and they're not uh, scrambling to, to try to figure it out. So up here on this, I've got 1130. It's actually 12-1 is the date that we're going live in a permissive environment here um, in the county clerk's office here in uh, Tarrant County uh, with a mandatory date of, of January 1st, of course. There's several things that we do in our implementation process to get from point A to point B, which is point A is inception and uh, point B is obviously the go live. Uh, during this process, there are, are steps along the way, but probably the most important for you guys is the training step. Now, each one of those electronic filing service providers is responsible for providing training on their portal. So it, your training that you will receive is really dependent upon the electronic filing service provider that you choose to use. What I encourage you guys to do is go find the EFSP that you want to use and test them out. Find out what kind of training opportunities that they offer and find out how much support that they're going to give you. And then make a decision on which one of those EFSPs that you want to use and start utilizing the system in the month of December before that January 1st deadline hits. If I could give any recommended steps as I close out today, I would do two things. Number one is immediately, as quickly as you can, go out and review the rule set, kind of what it says. That way when the new rules do come out, sometime in the month of December, you're just looking for what's been changed and you're, you're familiar with what those rules say, how it's going to impact you. Then by the end of the year, before that January 1st date, start practicing using the system. It doesn't mean you have to file everything electronically, but get familiar with it. And the reason we want to do that is because come January 1, not only Tarrant County, but all the other top 10 counties in the state are going to be going live. Chances are if you're using an EFSP, uh, you may be using an EFSP that some other attorneys may be utilizing as well. And if there's someone that procrastinates and waits till the first to start using the system, become familiar with it, you may have questions. But chances are there's probably some other attorneys and legal professionals that will have questions as well. Our guess is that those support lines, those, uh, whether it's a, a chat room or whether it's a phone or whether it's an email, will probably have a little bit longer of a delay on January 1st and that first week of January as opposed to the month of December. So I encourage you guys to get out and start using the system a little bit ahead of that. Become familiar with the processes so that on January 1st you can use it in a more effective and efficient model. Okay. With that, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for any questions that you guys may have. Yes, ma'am. So the question was, is that there's a lot of counties that are smaller here in the, uh, the area here around uh, Fort Worth and Tarrant County. Will those counties go live in a permissive environment when we go live in a mandatory environment? It really depends on the counties. If they're one of those 52, chances are they're probably going to be in a permissive environment well before then. Um, if they're not in the 52, we're really looking at our implementation strategy on how we're going to roll those out. What I'm using to develop that implementation strategy is the mandate, so I'm kind of falling in line with that. So if they're a smaller county that's not currently filing, chances are they'll probably go online probably about six months to a year, probably prior to their mandatory date. So you can kind of uh, kind of use that as kind of a, a rule of reference. Is there going to be a central list of those, or do we have to go to each county to find out? So the question is, is there going to be a central list of those counties? There is today. If you go out to textfile.com, uh, the participating court section, it's up in the header. Uh, it's a little uh, toolbar up at the top. If you click on participating courts, it'll walk you through. Um, it's a chart that shows whether the uh, district clerk, county clerk, JPs, uh, and probate courts are using the system. Uh, and if they're not, it gives you a date on when they're expected to go live. Okay. Yes, ma'am.
great. So the question is, what about attachments? So things like wills that require you to have an original signature. Very good question. Uh, a lot of that is governed by the rule set that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, a lot of that is uh, expected to come out in the final rule set. Um, if it doesn't come out in the final rule set, then of, of course it leaves it up for interpretation for the clerks and the courts here to then uh, make a decision on how they'll handle that. What we've seen a lot in terms of the permissive go live since it wasn't defined in the original rule set of regarding wills. Only thing that said in the original uh, rule set was that wills were not included in the mandate, obviously for the original wills. So um, what we've seen is we've seen um, we've seen a lot of counties do uh, actually file electronically the application for probate and scan in a copy of that will, and then the courts actually request to have that actual will within a certain duration. Um, that's what we see the most. I don't know, if Judge King, if you wanted to elaborate or wait until. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Um, on the computer um, <coughs> software, everything, if you can get PDF, you're okay. It doesn't matter what kind of system you're on or limitations, you know, are you on Windows this or Mac that? Or that right, yeah. Right, and the operating system, the computer that you use is irrelevant. It's just that they've got some specific standards by the PDFs, eight and a half by 11 searchable PDFs. So as long as you can get that, you're in good shape. Yes, sir. So uh, that's a great question. So the uh, question was, is that a couple of weeks ago there was a uh, question that came up, is is the text file EFSP compatible with iPads? And the answer was no. Um, currently today, it is not compatible. What we utilize in our EFSP for text file is an application called Silverlight. So as long as you can get Silverlight, you're good to go. Uh, chances are that the iOS uh, environments, things like iPads, iPhones, don't actually uh, utilize Silverlight. You can't use them. Um, we are updating our website to be HTML5. Once we do that, then you'll be able to utilize your iPads and your, your iPhones in order to file documents and things like that. Unfortunately, that's not going to be available on our EFSP portal until probably the middle of next year, um, as we're focusing right now on making sure that the implementations for all these counties are going live. Um, as far as any other uh, limitations, not that I'm aware of, other than as long as your system can uh, have silver light, you're, you should be in good shape. Um, pretty much every computer can do that, just iOS devices can't at this moment in time. Um, as far as any other EFSPs, there may be some that, that allow uh, an iPad friendly environment. I, I don't know. You'd have to go in and, and follow up with those specific providers to see if that's one of their uh, service ads. Okay. Yes, ma'am. It's really going to be something that's governed by the rule set and how they finally finalize that rule set. If it's not, then it'll be um, it'll be up to the clerk's decision on whether to uh, to kick that back or not. Um, according to that rule set, I I, I would say probably not. Um, but I, I, then again, I'm, I I don't know. It'd have to be whatever the rule set says. Um, they may say that attachments also have to be a searchable PDF. I didn't know. Um, Are you referring to it like an exhibit or yes. yeah? And those should not. Right. And Judge King will talk a little bit about that. But those documents should not be filed electronically, and, and we'll, the judge will expand on that. Right. There's a, a certain set of uh, documents that are in the rule set that says that they should not, not that they cannot, but they should not be filed electronically, and the rule set really spells those guys out pretty, pretty, pretty clear. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. The system's a two-way system, so if there's an order issued by the court, you get it electronically? It, yeah, so it, it's a... It's really a business process on how those are work. A lot of counties are handling orders specifically because they require judges' signatures a little differently. Um, some counties are uh, utilizing uh, what we call an e-filing queue for the judge for them to actually sign those electronically, and you get copies of those back. Um, other counties are using unique methods. Uh, 
printing them out there and actually acting as the runner um, to go get all those signatures and then scanning them back in and then e-filing them back. It's really a business process decision on the, the clerk on how that'll, that'll work. Um, what we'll do is we're working right now with the clerk's office to identify those processes, get them in place, and we'll try to document them and make them readily available to you guys before that January 1st mandate so you know exactly how it's going to work. Okay. What else? Any, yes, sir. Can you review with us the software or hardware requirements that we need to have besides a basic computer? What, uh, what software? Do we need a scanner? Do we need a, a certain type of uh, Adobe that's not already, that we don't already have standard? Gotcha. So the question is, is there any kind of hardware or software outside of a standard computer that you may need? Uh, it really just depends on how you're generating these documents. If you if you generate the documents um, it, within your computer today and you can convert that into a PDF, then you should be fine. If the documents are actually paper documents that you need to scan in, you probably would need a scanner in order to do that. I know that a lot of counties are actually putting kiosks in that allow you to come in and actually scan those documents directly in, um, providing that scanner for you so you don't have to go and buy that in the event that you need to do that, making that readily available in the clerk's office. Um, Adobe, there's versions of Adobe, and I'm not very uh, knowledgeable about those different versions, um, but there are different versions that will allow you to generate PDFs. I know you can also go into Word and do file save as a PDF, so there's several different avenues to go. As far as the hardware requirements, any basic computer um, that can host Silverlight should be fine. We've seen um, really, really minimum requirements in terms of specifications of what those are, but our minimum requirements, at least our recommended requirements, I should say, are found on our TextFile website. Right, so Silverlight is an add-on, um, and it's just a—it's kind of a, an add-on to any internet browser. If you go to the text file website, it'll pop up and tell you, "Hey, you don't have Silverlight. Would you like to download it now? It's free. You just say yeah, and it goes through that process." Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Great. So it's a lot faster than having to convert your document. Great. So it just, just a comment over here on the other side is an individual just uh, downloaded an a application called Nitro. Uh, instead of using Adobe, um, indicated that it was cheaper and it actually converts it into a searchable PDF in a lot faster uh, in a more efficient way. So thank you very much for that information. Yes, ma'am. Actually, Nitro is free. Oh. So uh, when I said cheaper, I actually meant really cheaper. So uh, <laughs> she just indicated that it was free. Thank you for that comment. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the, the question is, what about margins? Um, do we leave a, a larger margin on the top or the bottom, or how does that all work? All of that's identified in the statewide, statewide rules on, on specifications on what the document should look like and so forth. Terry, let's go. Um, if, if, if nobody has any more questions, let's let the clerk, let's let my office jump in and just kind of give some basic information on our side of the fence, Perfect. and then we'll take a sh quick break, and then we'll bring Judge King up, who's going to speak directly to you all about certain things, and um, then we'll be done. And thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Good morning. Thank you for allowing us to come and speak with you this morning and share a little bit of information with you. Um, I am Arlene Jr. I am the civil manager um, for the Tarrant County Clerk's Office. I manage uh, the probate unit as well as the county courts at law, which is, which is the civil division. Uh, this is Jim Pollux. Jim is the assistant manager in the probate office. Many of you may know Jim. You may see him and talk to him. And I'm sure all of you know Debbie Williman. Debbie Williman is the supervisor in the probate office. She could not be here with us this morning. Somebody had to stay back and man the office. Um, but we will all be available. Uh, we have business cards we're going to leave with you today. If you have questions, please continue to call us with those questions. As Mary Louise indicated earlier, we do not have all the, all the answers uh, identified yet. As a matter of fact, I don't think we have most of the questions identified. Uh, Judge King is going to come back and talk to you after the break, and I believe
believe. I sat down with Judge King last week, and I believe that a lot of your questions or a lot of his, his presentation will compel you and compel some questions, and I think we'll get some more identified that we have not. What we're doing is as we, as we gather your questions, we're answering them, and we are pushing those out on an FAQ on the county clerk's website. Uh, I implore you to keep looking at that. That's a living, breathing, doc, breathing document, and as we identify more business processes uh, and some answers to your questions, we will push those things out to you uh, as quickly as we get them. I just want to ask a question. Actually, I want to respond to, uh, just add on to something, um, the question about the Adobe software. A few law firms and small law firms and solo practitioners said that are asking questions about what if I can't afford uh, that software and uh, or at least the initial cost of that, what are my options? And I don't remember if, Derry, if Terry covered it, but uh, there are a couple of EFSPs out there that will turn your documents into a searchable PDF um, that for a small fee. I don't know what those fees are associated with that, but that is an option for you. Uh, I invite you to go out and look at those EFSPs, look at the options and the other services they provide. They do fall under that zero to question mark that uh, Mr. Derrick had in his presentation this morning. Um, just want to ask a couple of questions. How many of you have read the Supreme Court order? Okay, I'm going to ask you, I think it's very important that you read this order and that you understand what's in the context of this order, the content. And Judge King will probably follow up with that this morning and talk a little bit more about the order. Also, the, uh, the rules governing electronic filing uh, in Texas, um, please go out and read those documents. If you do not have them, uh, there is a link on the county clerk's website uh, where you can get easy access to those documents. Oh, it's in the material. It's in your material. Um, also, uh, how many of you have gone out and looked at the EFSPs? Are signed up with an EFSP. If you have not, it is important that you do that, um, that you select one, go out and look at the, the options and look at the cost and go out and select one as quickly as possible. We did earlier, Mary Louise identified or, or, or mentioned that in Tarrant County, we have a permissive go live date of December 1st. So effective December 1st, you will begin to file your, you can begin filing your documents on your cases electronically with the clerk's office. That will allow us to um, tweak our business processes to just get ready because January 1 is coming really quickly and we want to be ready. So we're going to use that as a, as, a, as a month to pilot and to, to tweak and to ensure that we have everything in place in the clerk's office office and in the court um, to ensure that we're ready for January 1st. Some of you may be filing on January 1st, but at least on January 2nd. Um, I also want to make sure that you understand that you, need, you have to have an email address. So please, if you don't have an email address, we do hear from time to time that I don't have an email address and I don't use email. You're going to have to have an email address and you're going to have to use email uh, to participate in electronic filing. Um, I also want to note um, that Derry, uh, Terry mentioned a $2 electronic um, filing fee that will be assessed by the clerks. That fee is not um, going to last for the life of electronic filing. It is, um, by statute, it is effective only until 2019 or until the, the county recoups or recovers its costs. So that will not always be in place. As soon as we get our, we can recover our costs, that fee is going to go away. So I just wanted to note that. Also, there are a few things that we're going to be requiring in the county clerk's office um, that you are, for the most part, you're using now, but it will be required with electronic filing. Uh, it's One is the civil case information sheet. Are all of you familiar with the civil case information sheet? Um, and then we have a supplementary probate information sheet. Are you all using that form? Great, great. Continue to use it. Um, but we are going to be requiring those and we're going to find some ways, um, creative ways within the case manager, within the, the electronic filing service to ensure that those get, those are included. 
We also will be requiring something that you have not, some of you may or may have submitted it, but the county clerk's effective January 1, we will require a citation request form and we will have a, a, an official change of address form. Some of you have been very diligent in sending letters and uh, noticing the clerk when you change your address, when you change your of address, uh, but we will be requiring an official change of address. It's important that we have your address on record. Uh, so those are just some of the things that are coming down the pike for us. Um, in your handouts, you have a FAQ that's been created uh, by the county clerk's office. There are about 14 questions that we asked, that we've answered, identified and answered in that FAQ. Please look over those. Some of them are very elementary questions about e-filing and answers, uh, questions and answers about e-filing, but some of them get more into what should I do and what can I do, what are my options. And again, as I mentioned earlier, that is going to grow. That is a living, breathing document, and it's going, going to grow, especially over the next couple of weeks. We will be working feverishly with um, Terry and his team at, um, at Tyler to uh, carve out some of our uh, some additional business processes. We're sitting down with the court. Judge King and Judge Furchell are giving us guidance, and we're working um, uh, in, in cooperation with them to try to identify those things that we need to have in place uh, by January 1, and certainly some of the things that we will have in place by December 1. And that's kind of really all I wanted to share with you this morning. And what we were we were hoping to do is to come back. Judge King has a um, a very comprehensive uh, presentation, and what we thought we'd do was come back after he. Um, gives his presentation because I believe again that he's going to some questions, he's going to compel you to ask some questions you may have not thought of and then we'll come back on the clerk side and maybe kind of partner with Judge King and answer some of those questions. Right. Yes, Mark. Do you have a quick question about e-filing and yes. file stamp? Yes. yes. Okay, that's a great question. Um, you can file 24/7 in uh, the in, in electronically. That your document will get the it will receive the file stamp date when you submitted your document. Not on if you submit a document on Saturday night at 6 p.m. and the clerks come in at 9 o'clock on Monday morning. Your, and we accept that document. Once we accept it, uh, your, your document will get the file mark date the, the time you submit it. Does that make sense? Yeah. It'll get the date and time that you submit it, unless we happen to reject it. Not we, the date and time that you accept no. it, but the date and time we file it. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. So, and Terry had that covered in his presentation. I, I don't think you, maybe you elaborated on it. <laughs> Okay. There you go. Hey, so uh, the question was, is if it's rejected, what date? Right now, the Supreme Court is finalizing that rule set. I just spoke with the Office of Court Administration who has uh, an insight on kind of how the rule set's coming along. What they informed me was that if it's rejected, they're working on the duration on when you can actually resubmit that. So the, the, right now, the latest that I've heard is a 48-hour time period. So as long as you resubmit it within 48 hours, it utilizes that first date. If you miss that 48-hour time period, then whenever you resubmit it, it's going to take on that new date. So even though that's what I'm hearing, it hasn't been finalized in the rule set. So I encourage you, as soon as that rule set's put out in December, go, go grab that final rule set and read up on it. But... Uh, our initial inkling is telling us that that's how it's going to be handled. Okay. Anything, Mark? One 
one two dollar fee is assessed per transaction so if you have if you file a motion an order a proposed order uh supporting documents in that transaction they're all part of that that one cause so we do say we do ask that you 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 do not file multiple documents uh for different cause numbers in a in a in a, in a folder if you will what we're asking that you do you can file rather multiple documents related to that cause and you are assessed two dollars per transaction. So, yes, yes, it is. Yes, that's correct. Yes, sir. Will be for both. Be for both new and existing cases. You can start practicing on your cases you've already have in uh, before the courts. Yes. Okay. Um, what we're going to do now, I believe uh, Monica's going to come back. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. We're going to move up our schedule a little bit and take a 15-minute break now. So if you would be back at 5 after the hour. Um, there's refreshments in the other room. Restrooms are to this side and also back by the elevator. We'll get started with Judge King and then have an additional question and answer session at the end. Thank you. Let's get started again. Uh, just a few housekeeping things before we start back up with Judge King. If you need um, CLE, there are attorney CLE cards and paralegal CLE certificates on the table out here. The course number is out there as well. Um, I just wanted to, I noticed that there was a course number on the PowerPoint presentation, and that number is different from the number that we have for today. The number for today is if you're all ready, 9012-80410. And again, that's on a, a sign-in sheet. It's, it's on with the information located on the sign-in table. Um, so there, please note that there are two separate CLE forms. There are the attorney cards, the scantrons that you're used to filling in, and then a paralegal certificate. You can have any anyone from the board of directors um, sign it. That would be me or Beth or Dustin, if they're in here. Beth is back there, and Dustin, I don't see at the moment. There he is over here. Um, anybody else you can find on the, the board of directors. Please mark your CLE forms for three hours. This is a three-hour presentation. Um, and then, is Amy Stone in here? Have we seen Amy? She's here. If you see Amy, please give her a big thank you. She's the one that organized all of this. Um, we couldn't have done this without her. So thank you, Amy, wherever you are, for putting all this together. All right, so we're going to pick back up with Judge King, um, and he's going to talk about some of the electronic filing in, uh, issues specific to probate as well as some electronic updates. Uh, Judge King needs no introduction. So here he is, Judge King. The old Chinese curse is, may you live in interesting times. Isn't this interesting? The paper e-filing in a nutshell has as appendices pretty much everything anybody has commented on. When I wrote this, I went through the FAQ from the clerk, the Supreme Court rules, and I'll let put my coffee down. I'm not going to. Oh, it's right here. I'm not going to make it through this if I can't keep my throat moist. I heard the comment earlier today that I've been a, I've been involved with this since the beginning. Well, it's a frame of reference. The beginning of this process was about 1995. In 1996. I went on the Supreme Court's IT committee, and that's when we established our goal of implementing mandatory e-filing in Texas. So go ahead and blame me. It's okay. Um, I don't think, in, you know, I don't have to sell you on what a good idea it is. You know, Moses came down from the mountain with the stone tablets. In our case, that was the Chief Justice Jefferson. 
you know, the mandate has gone forth, and so it's not a question of selling it at this point. It's a question of trying to make it more, less painful, more palatable. A lot of the things that I was going to talk about have already been covered, which is probably a good thing. Um, I'm going to specifically address the Supreme Court rules. They are appendix, they're one of the appendices, let me see. They are, the Supreme Court rules are the uh, appendix B. I've got a, a five page outline and then I have the Supreme Court mandate so you can read the mandate as it, as it came down. And then the initial filing rules and then a, something no one's talked about today, and that is the Tarrant County e-filing rules. How many of y'all knew that we adopted e-filing rules in 2007? The clerks do. Mark does. We were one of the first counties to do e-filing in Texas, and to do that we had to have official rules approved by the Supreme Court. Now. As this goes forward, and what you'll see from time to time is you'll see something about local rules, and then you will see standing orders. And the difference between standing orders and local rules is that the Supreme Court approves local rules. Standing orders, we sneak by on our own. There are going to be a lot of standing orders issued with regard to e-filing, and that's because when the Supreme Court IT committee submitted the proposed e-filing rules to the Supreme Court, we submitted, you know, if you format it the same for comparison purposes, we submitted seven pages of e-filing rules. And what we got back, at least so far, is four pages of official e-filing rules. So they chose not to address three pages of stuff. Plus, there's a lot of other things, the discussions that went on in our frequent committee meetings about these rules over a period of a few years that, you know, I, I felt like my job on that committee was to say, wait a minute, what about probate? You know, probate's different. And it was really interesting to have to argue with district judges and appellate judges that no, we don't throw the will away after it's admitted to probate. <laughs> they had no, no concept. Well, it's just a piece of paper. Well, not exactly. And so that's why there is a specific prohibition that wills don't get e-filed. Well, you know, and I know that's the number one question we've been getting, and I'm going to address that. Let's talk about who doesn't e-file. If you come up against someone who is a, and, and the term, you know, somebody from, from a, a tech company said, well, what are you going to do about SRLs? And I went, uh, pardon me? Self-represented litigants. We call them pro se. We call them other things, too. <laughs> uh, people who are self-represented cannot be compelled to e-file. Interestingly, on the, on the uh, example that we had earlier today where the divorce petition was filled in by hand, it was e-filed. Uh, so they don't have to e-file, but they can. The other exemption from e-filing is attorneys in counties where e-filing is permissive but not yet mandated. What does that leave everybody else? If you're an attorney and you are filing something and it's in a county where the mandate is in place, you will e-file. It's that simple. The implementation timeline you saw, you can look it up and see, you know, you may already be a winner where you're going to be. You do have to have an email address. It will have to go into your signature block on every document. That's a reason to reject the filing. If, if we don't have an email address, the clerk doesn't have an email address. We're going to be doing more and more by email. You know, we're, a lot of our processes like confirming hearings and requesting hearings and things like that. It's just going to be better to do it by email. Uh, the statewide structure we talked about. Let's do a walkthrough. You already got a bit of a walkthrough 
on what the process is. I'm going to give you my take on the walkthrough. First, you establish your account. It's just like if you're going to go on eBay to buy or sell something. You give them a certain amount of information, and most importantly to them, you give them a credit card reference, credit card, debit card, some kind of account. I have no idea if they take PayPal or not. <laughs> yeah. Then you're going to have cover sheets to fill in. Once your account is set up, it knows who is filing. You're going to then have to do the cover sheet. Uh, the cover sheets, you know, were, were as a result of the Supreme Court saying, let's find some mechanisms to kind of start the process ahead of time. And that's why we have that cover sheet. The supplemental cover sheet is because the probate judges got together and said, you know, we don't have any way other than getting our own clerks to give us a census of what gets filed to capture the information when it comes budget time, when it comes legislative time, to have any, any uh, demographic information on the number of probate procedures in the state. And so we started a few years ago with these cover sheets. They're actually going to be institutionalized. They're going to be built into the process so that it, you, it's not that you get to fill them out. You have to fill them out. Uh, certainly, on the supplemental cover sheets, any additional input, if, if there's just a, a lot better way to do it, we're always wanting to get input. And, and we may take the uh, advice. The uh, exemptions are waivers from the fees on being able to file. Uh, governmental entities don't have to pay e-filing fees. People who have filed an affidavit of inability to pay costs and it has not been successfully challenged or challenged at all, don't have to pay. And then it, it's not in any rules or business process yet, but I'm sure going to stick up for the fact that ad litems don't have to pay. So, you know, if you're going to be a guardian ad litem, you're going to file a guardianship, you will have an exemption from having to file unless you've got an estate that's got money and you've got access to the money. The clerk's website is going to be your best resource for what your filing fees is going to be. If you hadn't picked up on it, nobody really knows all the answers or even a lot of the answers right now because the Supreme Court hadn't told us what it's going to be. And we're working like crazy to try and anticipate, you know, it's kind of a Dalmatian type thing. The, the Supreme Court picks the spots, and then we get to figure out the rest of it. And so we're, we're trying hard to, if you will, imagine how it's going to work and what's going to make the most sense. Let me suggest this to you, and we're going to run out of time. I don't, you know despite the fact that we've got a bunch of time left, we will run out of time this morning. Um, if you have suggestions for how things could work and we don't address it, or if you have questions and they don't get asked, and if they do get asked, Mark doesn't get it written down, please write your questions down and get them to me so that I can get back to you. We may have to figure out what the answer is. Like I said, a lot of these we, we don't know yet. We are in discussions. We are trying to put as much down. And, and one of the, the, the last appendix to this paper, it says business processes. And what that is, is, is the rest, that's filling in the rest of where the Supreme Court's already said, here are the spots where we have the rules and you figure out the rest. So please help us. Okay. What's the worst way to make a PDF? You take your document, you print it out in hard copy, and you scan it in. That is a non-machine non readable, non-searchable PDF. How does the Supreme Court put stuff on its website? Just like that. When the mandate came down, they put non-searchable PDFs on their website. Who knew? Our former Chief Justice had a standing rule 
that anything that was e-filed in the Supreme Court, he wanted two hard copies on his desk. Go figure. Now, Nitro PDF Creator, yes, it's free. I personally prefer Primo PDF. I've, I've got a reference to it, in, not in this paper, but in the other paper. Uh, they both just are flawless. They're, 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 they're very expensive. They're free. There is another piece of software, and I'm getting ahead to my other paper. Let me explain. I brought another paper, A, in case we actually ran out of anything to talk about, and B, because I started putting an outline together about lawyers and iPads a year or so ago, and we were had been looking for a time to present it, and it, the logistics of putting on a seminar or such that, you know, we didn't know when we would ever get it done. And so it seemed like a good time at least to put the material in your hands. So when I say the other outline, it's the, the legal iPad and iPhone outline. Another piece of software that you need to just go online and spend $10 for is called Abby, A-B-B-Y, or Y-Y, Screenshot Reader. And sometimes it comes free bundled with little scanners. I have what's called a magic wand scanner that you literally pass it over the page and it scans. And it came with this Abby screenshot reader. I don't use that little scanner a lot. I use the screenshot reader every day because it allows you to capture things off of the computer screen and turn it into text or turn it into a JPEG so that you know, if you're looking at somebody else's document, you can actually, it doesn't have to be machine readable, you can take the text off the screen and you may have to do a little cleanup, but you, you don't have to input all your text. Abby Screenshot Reader. Um, let's talk about sensitive data. This is a real important thing to me. I think it's probably a real important thing to you as probate lawyers what is sensitive data? Well, again, the Supreme Court doesn't see it the same way as probate lawyers see it. Sensitive data to the Supreme Court is numbers and only numbers. And so the rule says you will not file documents containing sensitive data. What is this? This is a redaction requirement. And how do you redact? You use X's in place of the digits. You leave the last three digits unredacted, so a social security number is going to be XXX-XX-X5307, or 530. You don't file a motion to redact once e-filing starts. You have the responsibility to redact. You also have a responsibility to maintain the unredacted document through the life of the proceeding. Does that have a nice ring if you've got a guardianship that goes for 38 years? But that's your responsibility. Now, that's fairly straightforward. If for some reason you have to file something that is not redacted, you have to give the clerk notice that, it's, that it contains sensitive data. I can't really think of anything that's going to be that way because of a business process that I, I'm proposing that we're going to need to be using, and that is not just sensitive data, but documents containing sensitive information. We have a lot of things, particularly in guardianship and also in inventories, which have sensitive information. And, you know, that's why we've got the affidavit in lieu of inventory is because the estate planning lawyers felt like they were losing business to the trust planners because the trust people said, well, we can keep it all secret. And so they shoved down our throats the affidavit in lieu of inventory where co-owners don't even find out what they're claiming the decedent owned. And I just, I see a lot of problems with that. But if you have a document containing sensitive information, what we're going to, what, what I'm going to propose 
this is just me on this. I don't have a buy-in from court two. I don't have a buy-in from the clerk's office. I don't have a buy-in from the lawyers. But let's say that you've got a guardianship and you're going to file a doctor's letter. How many of y'all have heard of the Texas Medical Privacy Act? That's called HIPAA on a national scale. The law says you do not file anything which contains protected health information. Well, tell me what part of a doctor's letter is not protected health information other than the cause number. And so this is something that, and in the language of the Supreme Court e-filing rules, other statutes prohibit filing. How are we going to deal with this? It's got to be in the file. It's got to be, well, it's got to be before the court. And certainly, if you're a lawyer in that case, you're entitled to that information. So my suggestion is it's going to be something that you're going to give the clerk notice. This is a document containing sensitive information, not sensitive data, sensitive information. It would, the true, same would be true of information about uh, something in a guardianship that mentioned mental health commitments because that is made confidential by law. Something with regard to uh, adult protective service investigation, uh, services investigations, that is made confidential by law. I've got this list in the business processes, by the way. Two possible ways of dealing with this. One is file it as an exhibit. That's problematical because, you know, exhibits are only kept for three years under other statutes. If it's filed as a designated document containing sensitive information, it then becomes a non-public document. The clerk can make it where someone going online to look at it can't see it. But there'd be a requirement that if you're involved in that case, you get a copy of it. Does that make sense to anybody? Uh, if, you, if you can find a problem with any of these business processes, please let me know. Now, number one question, what do we do with wills? Here's what I think we'll do with the will. If you have already got a scan of the will, or if, like Mark Sullivan tells me, he used to do his wills and leave a pretty good gap at the top so that it could be copied without having to be unstapled, you scan your will, you e-file with, with the will attached as a, you know, part of the filing. Then within 10 days of your e-filing, you bring that will to us or you send that will to us. If it's within 10 days of the filing, it's going to get to us for review probably before your return date, at least on your return date so that we have a chance, if there's an issue of whether it is an original will, or if there is a forensic issue with the will itself, we've got some time to deal with it and still keep it on the setting for an uncontested hearing. If it's necessary for you to unstaple the will to make your copy, well, you know, the clerk has to do that 10 times out of 10. And the policy in the clerk's office, next time you have a, a probate jacket, just go back and look at the will. And where the original will might have been stapled up here, you're going to find just the holes. And you're going to find a new staple about an inch down on the left-hand side with some initials by it. And that's what we're going to ask you to do. If you have to take the will apart to scan it and reassemble it, then we want you to staple where nobody else is stapled and put your initials, or whoever reassembles it, put their initials by the staple. Then we've got a chain of custody. We're getting into the realm of evidence and forensic evidence because the staple holes, you know, we see wills that don't have the same staple holes on each page. And chances are it's perfectly innocent. It's something that the lawyer did trying to get the will executed and they had to rerun some pages and correct some things. And if so, there'll be testimony to that effect. And if there's not, somebody's messed with that will. And you know, that does happen and there are cases where these staple holes were the decisive forensic evidence on the admissibility of the entire document. I think that'll work.
non-conforming documents, you know, if you don't redact it right, it may get kicked back. The current rule says that the substitute document keeps the original file date, and uh, I haven't seen anything the Supreme Court is, is uh, thinking about doing or changing, so we don't know about the 48-hour uh, the window. Okay, so you, you fill out, you set up your account, you fill out the cover sheets, you select what it is you're going to file. Hopefully we will have the supplemental cover sheet with enough things that you don't have to check other. Other and miscellaneous are the two worst, you know, filing designations. There are main documents and there are supporting documents. Your motion is your main document. A will would be a supporting document. An order would be a supporting document. What we're going to ask is if you're going to submit an order to us, it's okay if you want it to be e-filed as a supporting document, but what we really want you to do is to email an editable copy of the order to us so that if we've got changes or ultimately if we want to put it into a queue where we can e-sign, and I e-sign documents every day. We do a limited range of what we e-sign, but we, uh, you know, Tarrant County is one of the first counties where the judges were able to get uh, carpal tunnel syndrome just from clicking the mouse instead of having to write our signature so many times. Um, then you hit file, and you get an email back, just like when you order something on Amazon, they confirm your order. There's an auto-confirm. You'll get an auto confirm from text file, and then you'll get a second confirmation from the clerk when it's accepted. So you'll have some proof. You can e-file up until midnight and preserve that filing day. There is something about Saturday, Sundays, and legal holidays that about being deemed filed the next business day. That may change with what the Supreme Court's going to be doing. If, if your document requires a motion in order to be able to file it, it's going to be deemed filed on the date that the order is signed. If there is a super typhoon that comes through and the system goes down, you're going to be able to ask the court for relief when you show when you tried to file it and, you know, there was a massive blackout or fire or what have you. Now, the things, the other things that don't get e-filed, I mean, original wills, obviously you can't feed the original will into the computer. So we talked about how you do that. Your surety bond. When you have a surety bond for guardianship or dependent administration, we're going to have to have the original bond. Because if all we have is a copy of the bond or some kind of electronic copy of a bond, we don't have independent confirmation from the surety that this is their final word on it. And so we're going to, as a business process, require surety bonds to be hand filed. Just about anything else I can think of comes under the heading of exhibits, and the rules talk about some other things not to be e-filed, documents presented in camera solely for the purpose of admissibility, uh, documents under seal pursuant to Rule 76 or its probate code, soon to be a state's code equivalent, or if we have a rule like we're talking about, a court rule or some other statute that says you will not do this. What's an electronic signature? Well, as, as you saw on the PowerPoint, it's slash S slash and the typed name. That is accepted as an electronic signature. We don't have to see a handwritten, you know, a, a, a facsimile, as it were, of a handwritten signature. Now, if you want to do that, if you want to have a JPEG signature that you can, you know, hit insert from file and you go and you get your signature and you drop your signature in there, you can do that. It's, it's provided for in the rules. I think, you know, it, there's then another can of worms that 
mentioned in the rules and not explained, and that's electronic notarization. And if you look at the Texas Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, it talks about electronic notarization, and there's also a reference on the Secretary of State's website about electronic notarization. I think, I think nobody has specifically and thoroughly addressed it yet. I think there's a couple of ways you can do it. One is to have someone notarize it by hand, and you scan that as a searchable PDF, and you drop it in the document. The other way is to have a slash S slash in the name of the notary, Notary Public State of Texas, my commission expires and date. And it says electronic notarization is effective if all of the required information is logic, logically associated with it is located in the document. Another thing says, another one of these references says that an electronic seal must contain all of the required elements of the statute. And then they don't say what the required elements are. <laughs> because when you look at what the, what the notary seal says, it says name, you know, where you're a notary, state of Texas, when your commission expires. And then it says the seal shall contain a five-pointed star with, state, with Texas wrapped around it, cannot be bigger than this or wider than this, and has to have a wavy border, whether it's round or rectangular. You know, it's not hard. You take out your iPhone, you take a picture of the seal, you save it as a JPEG, you know, you, you, you crop it, which you can do just with the camera app now, and save the, save the seal so that you can cut and paste the seal onto the document when you e-file it. It's not that hard. Okay. E-notices from the court, right back at you. You e-file something to us, and we can e-file back to you. Non-conforming documents and official record we talked about. E-service. Most of these rules are all within Rule 21, which is the notice and service rule of the Rules of Civil Procedure. And... New, the new part of Rule 21A says that you can make service by in person, by agent, by courier receipt delivery, by certified or registered mail, by fax machine, or electronically through text file, or by such other manner as the court may direct. Okay, so nothing really new there except adding e-filing. Except, and the except eclipses all the rest of it. If you're e-filing, you have to serve attorneys by e-service, unless the court directs otherwise. So if they're in a county where they don't do e-filing, yes, you can send them an email notice, or you can, you know, what, whatever other the court will allow. Is that unclear? If, if you're serving, if you got lawyers in Tarrant County, Dallas County, Harris County, Travis County, you can serve them by email, by, by e-filing. And that's that thing that you fill in at the end that he said most people don't mess with. You're going to need to mess with it. <laughs> now, what if someone says, well, I have not consented to e-service? Well, if you are a lawyer in Texas and you file something, yes, you have. It is implicit in your use of the system, just like when you upgrade your, uh, your software with Apple and, you know, you click that you have read and agreed to the 37 pages of terms and conditions. Has anybody ever read all that? <laughs> Not me. E-service is completed when you hit send, you have done what you're supposed to do. Even so, and this was something that we, we recommended to the Supreme Court that they forget about, but they didn't. 
and that is that the mailbox rule still applies, even though you're e-serving. They're going to add three days to any deadline. It doesn't make sense to me, but it's, you know, it's a grace. They recognize lawyers are busy. Also, we still, the, there has to be a certificate of service. That is mandated by the Supreme Court rules, a certificate of service. So you put in the certificate of service and show who you serve and certify that you have done so by this filing. In addition to that, there is a Tarrant County local rule on certificate of conference. And I expect, at least in my court, this is going to be enforced more than it has been in the past. So, and the certificate of conference is not, I called and left a message. Because we have so many docket control conferences where everybody comes back into chambers and they say, hi, I'm Joe Smith. They've never met. They've never actually talked. And we end up a, f a fair amount of the time within 15 minutes, oh, we can settle this. Well, you know, I could have used that time for somebody that couldn't settle it. So we're going to start kind of holding your feet to the fire a little more on the certificates of conference. The appendices are attached. We've still got a lot of time, and that's good because you're going to get three hours of CLE whether you like it or not. <laughs> I think at this point in time, we need to take questions. Can you walk me through, or just clarify, we can have an electronic notarization of an electronic signature? That's correct. Can you have an electronic notarization of electronic signature? Yes. If you look, there's a there's a reference in the outline to the Business and Commerce Code, which says that you can specifically do that. And basically, how many of y'all, and I know some of you are here, that practice law before we had fax machines? <laughs> you know, the current issue, <laughs> raise his hand up, uh, the, the, the current issue of uh, the bar journal there is an interview of what was it like before fax machines, Bob? <laughs> but you know, when fax machines first came out, and I still remember the first fax that we got in our office, we had to make arrangements for someone to bring the suitcase in and set it up and put the acoustic coupler handset, handset of the phone into it, and then we all stood and watched while it took eight <laughs> minutes, took eight minutes to transmit one page and it was a spinning drum. And that's how they've been transferring photos for newspapers for 60 years. But a lot of people went, no, I'm gonna wait for a real copy. No, I don't, that's not real. And of course, the first thing we had to do once we got that kind of wet fax was go to the copy machine and make a copy because it was gonna turn totally black within a certain number of days. People didn't accept it as real. E-signatures, when the first e-filings came back in 2008 and the clerk's office came down to me and they said, there's no, no handwritten, handwritten signature on this. And I wasn't, didn't want to be ugly. I was going to ask, how, how would they get it on there? <laughs> I, you know, I'm sorry. Touch sensitive screen. It's a convention. It's something that we accept. It's like you're in federal court and you don't have to swear to something because you filed it, you swore to it. And so when you put S slash S slash and your name printed, that's the same thing as taking a pen or a, you know, a hammer and chisel or whatever and making your mark. It's just you have made an electric mark. Now think about this. When was the last change that was this major in the way we did things? When paper was invented. You know, there really hadn't, we, we quit writing on skins and started writing on paper. Well, not me personally, but 
I, there were some older lawyers in the firm I was with, but <laughs> this is a big deal. This is a big change. It's making us think about things differently. Uh, there was a paper, and if you can get a hold of it, you need to go read it, called Writing for Rewired Minds. It was part of the advanced estate planning course about three years ago. And it talks about how we read, how we look at the page, and how you group information on the page to make it faster to understand. And so, yes, it's, it's a new concept. And if you have what the code says, 322.00 something, business commerce code, that if you have all the required elements there and everything logically associated with it, it's good to go. Second question. With regards to that notarization, my understanding is though that you have to keep an original that's actually got that ink signature on it. If you do it that way, but if you put an elect if you have an electronic notarization and you have an electronic seal, there is no retention requirement because that is the original. But, but, so, but there's, you're not going to have an electronic notarization on a will unless you're in Australia. Australia recognized e-wills last week. But, Don't tell anybody. That's correct. And the law says everything already required of a notarization still applies. So it's personally appeared before me. But then the notary is going to say, yeah, you can put my seal on there. You can put my name on there. It's been done. So, but you may have to have that JPEG of 10 different notaries in your files. So it's going to take up a lot of space, isn't it? <laughs> space is cheap. But yeah, electronic space is cheap. Yes. Yes. To give you the long answer. Well, the reason why I'm asking is because I was called the other day stating that an inventory that we had submitted was not the original signature because they had signed it and then shot it back through us to email because she was out of town. It was going to be out of town for a while. Okay. So that's why I was asking. And, and it can be electronically signed as well. It's just that it's, nobody's crossing their fingers when they have the slash S slash in their name. That binds them as a binding signature. No, I'm talking about an actual client that signs the I'm, I'm talking about actual clients electronically signing documents. Okay. You have them before you and you say, we can do this now this way. Are you okay with that or do you want to physically sign it? And they're going to be just as bound. Yeah, because if we don't want to carve up your order, we'll use the one that you send us. Okay. And so will those email addresses be provided? It's going to vary by the court. You know, it, it may go to the administrator. It may go to the staff attorney. It may go to the associate, excuse me, associate judge. Uh, but, yeah, we'll let you know. Question. Right now the public can see a docket sheet. How much of all this filing will the public have access? That's a real good question. Um, they're going to have a lot more information. There is still some question about whether we want to have unfettered electronic access for the public. Uh, the clerk has indicated, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, but Ms. You know, the elected official clerk has told me that her attitude is if you've got a bar license or if you can figure out someone's bar number, you can log on and look at the jacket electronically. Now, as I said, there's going to be some non-public images. And so even if you can log on, you won't be able to see those non-public images if we do it the way we're talking about doing it. Uh, am I confusing anybody? Okay, because some, some images can be made non-public, birth certificates and things like that. 
they may be in the electronic sea out there, but unless you have the authority to see them, you're not going to get to see them. Follow up. Do you have to have a bar number associated with the case then? Or I suspect not. That's, you know, the cement's not set up on that yet. Um, and except, and, and again, I'm making this up as I'm talking because we don't have a policy on this, but I'm real worried about the Texas Medical Privacy Act and our, th our having things in the jackets that the law says we're not supposed to have and it gives someone then a cause of action against the public officials for having it in there and against the lawyers for putting it in there. And so I suspect that the paper file, to the extent that we will continue to have paper files, that the non-public documents won't be in there. There may be a placeholder. There may be something that says that there is a doctor's letter or a letter from APS to the court or whatever it is, but it's not going to be there. Otherwise, the files are going to be open to anybody who wants to look at them, and that's called functional obscurity <coughs> because no one goes down to look at them. Uh, you know, newspaper reporters that are looking to, you know, do something or people that are wanting to sell widows more insurance or sell their house. Uh, but, you know, the bright 14-year-old in Sri Lanka that's going to cause mischief on the Internet is not going to come down and look at the physical file. And that's what electronic access, that's, that's the, the devilment in it to me, and that's what I worry about is it someone mining data that's got no business in that case whatsoever. Next question. The cover sheet. The rule says, and, and this may not be your question, the rule says you have to designate lead counsel at the initial filing. Okay, and putting in email addresses, is there only a place for one email address? I don't know that yet. We'll find out together. <laughs> All attorneys have to have an email address, but you have to have a designation of lead counsel. Okay. Scan it. Huh? Just scan it. And then I can scan it PDF and that's going to work. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, you know, it's going to, it, as long as you can make it a, a searchable PDF, and the devil may be in the details, and part of it's going to be figuring out how to do it. Last night as I was working on this, I, I went online and, and got a notary seal JPEG and cut and paste it into my notes, which is a PDF. I also took that same thing and printed it from a JPEG. Does everybody know what we're talking about, JPEGs? No. JPEG is a... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> JPEG's a picture. There's, there's several different standardized formats for image files, a GIF, a graphic interchange format, and a JPEG, and I'm not going to give you the real names behind everything, but JPEG is the most often used. It makes the smallest file size. And uh, I talked about Abbey Screenshot Reader. You can take any picture you see on the screen and save it as a JPEG. And, uh, and it doesn't matter if it's a non-clickable image or not, or if it's something that would otherwise, you know, have something else pop up. When you use the Screenshot Reader, it it will kind of, it's much better than just doing print screen because you can selectively take things off the screen and save them as, as JPEGs. That was before the law changed. And so I would submit to you that statutes of the state of Texas supersede any local rules and we're 
we're up for redoing our local e-filing rules because they have not been revisited. They, they were revised in 2008 after the Supreme Court and some others said, oh, well, this is not workable. But we had to have that in place to do any e-filing at all. Question up here. It's going to be eight and a half by eleven. That's the Supreme Court rule. The 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 font size, well, without naming names, we we did have a lawyer that thought it was a good idea to use the software the the uh, court reporters use to get four pages on one eight and a half by eleven page. We don't, you know, that that didn't last very long. Um, don't know. You know, we're going to see what gets abused. Uh, there's been no discussion about minimum font sizes. I know that the appellate courts are imposing a bunch of formatting requirements. And if you look at the proposed e-filing rules for the Supreme Court and for some of the different courts of appeals, uh, they have some very definite formatting requirements uh, and page length requirements as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And speaking of fillable documents, and this is getting into the iPad, iPhone, so forth, <clears throat> someone asked about hardware. Let me first disclaim any software or hardware I mention is because I use it and I paid for it. No one's giving me stuff to test. And this is not intended to be an official endorsement. It's just an insight into how I do it. You can do it however you want to. The first thing I would suggest is subscribe to Techno Lawyer. And we'll get into that outline in a minute. But if you've ever tried to drink from a fire hose, that's Techno Lawyer. This morning's posting was the definitive guide to iOS 7 plus 174 must-read articles. <laughs> That's once or twice a week. But if you don't look at anything else between that and iPhone JD, you're going to cover the waterfront. But it's not just tech. It's law firm marketing. It's management it's litigation, it's a lot of things, and then you can subscribe to Small Law, which is a newsletter for solo practitioners and small firms, and it's just a question of how much time can you spend hitting delete in your inbox without looking at something. But I try to spend some time, a little bit of time every day, and then a little more time on the weekends, um, a lot of times just gathering these articles and then when I'm stuck somewhere I have them where I can get to them electronically and, and actually read some of them. But having said that, one thing that gets discussed more than any other scanner is Fujitsu. And I, I bought a Fujitsu ScanSnap S1500, it's, or, or maybe it's not the 1500. There's a couple of, of, you know, iterations that have come out since then. It's a $500 scanner, and it comes bundled with a full version of Adobe Acrobat. Anybody know what Adobe Acrobat costs? $500. So you're getting $1,000 worth of stuff for $500. I actually have two of them. I have one at the courthouse and one at home. So when I want to get something scanned, I can scan it. It scans 30 pages a minute, color both sides. Turns it into a searchable PDF. Well, it turns it into a PDF. You can then set it up to make it a searchable PDF, and you can set it up to directly go into Dropbox or Evernote or, you know, wherever you want it to go. So talking about do I need a scanner, yeah, you really do, just for 
when you need to get something into the into the machine that you have a hard copy of. But um, you know, for my money, that's that's a, a good deal. Next question. <coughs> That's a good question. And will the clerks Yeah, if they are officially certified, they're going to have to accept them because the law requires them to accept them. But, you know, that's not something we've talked about yet. So. Next question. Gary. Judge, when we have routine hearings and we go and pick up our letters, can you kind of walk through how that's all going to Well, like electronic I wish I knew. <laughs> what I would like for it to be is that you e-file everything and you get the original will in. Let's just say it's probate a will. What I would like for it to be, and it won't be initially, is that you come in and we have everything electronic. And it's just like, I don't know if, how many of y'all go to a pharmacy where they require you to sign an electronic pad that obviously was left over from a credit card machine somewhere else. I suspect that's the ultimate of how we would do it for the witness to come in and sign their proof, is they can electronically sign it. And then we'll have it. And probably just because of the facility of keeping things moving is that we would the clerk in the courtroom would go ahead and hit print for the printer back in the clerk's office for the letters so that you can go pick up your letters some courts have the letters ready in the courtroom if you order them ahead of time I know Travis County does it that way but I don't have the tolerance for the noise level that they have in Travis County because they handle four hearings simultaneously in, in a queue so that there's people talking and giving testimony and the judge is asking questions simultaneously all in one room. And I'm sorry, that I don't think your clients want that. I think it's more of a solemn occasion for them. And I want to try and preserve that with the choices that we make. So I think that's how it ultimately will work. I think January 1st or December 1st, when you're going to do it that way, you're still going to have a paper copy of your proof and a paper copy of your order, and we're going to sign those. Ultimately, I'd like for it, knock on wood, uh, I'd like for it to be as paperless as possible at some point, but the transition is not going to be without pain. Yes, ma'am. So are you saying that, uh, well, that's just the dinosaur that I have. Okay, you file your application, you know, you get the letters in the Nothing will be any different initially. Okay, but then are, are we supposed to then, before the hearing, electronically transmit that proof, order, and oath, and come in with a paper copy, or how's that going to work? I just try not to be stupid. That's what I'm we have, I have wanted it to be that way for years, because I assume you all know that both courts review your file completely before the hearing. And, you know, if we call you because we found something, it's to make you look better in front of your client that you can do things flawlessly, even if we've had to go back and forth four times to clean everything up. Because we want to make you look good. And we don't want to embarrass you. We certainly don't want to embarrass the client. When people are unwilling to cooperate with us, then maybe they get embarrassed. And when they argue with my staff, when they don't realize that my staff is just trying to help them, then, you know, maybe I need to talk to them in front of their client and the rest of the courtroom. Because we're really trying to help you. We, have, we, we don't have a dog in the fight other than to see that it's done right and hopefully done right the first time. And it's, it's rare that we don't have a case that 
you know, or, or dock it that we don't have to have somebody come back because, oh, well, I never could find anybody that could answer that question for me. Well, they didn't ask my staff because that was, you know, it was, it was job number one to say, yes, you need a disinterested witness on an airship proceeding. Does that answer your question? Well, I guess what I meant was is that, I mean, because I understand that you have two different transactions. So we have like, not. the hearing, should they just submit electronically the, the proof, order, and oath? I would prefer it. I would prefer it. Okay. We haven't mandated it yet. Okay. Some people do. There's a number of lawyers because... They have heard me talk about how much easier that makes everybody's job. And a lot of times when they do, I've got it right there in the jacket, and they walk up to the bench, and we just, you know, I swear the witness, and we take off running because I have everything I need, and I know the paperwork. I've already reviewed the paperwork, and I know the paperwork's not going to have to be marked up. How far ahead of time would you like this submitted? Travis County requires it one week ahead of time. And Dallas, Dallas does. And, you know, that's not, you know, that, I think that works. That's kind of a crowdsourcing answer. Judge, on that, uh, when we unstaple a will to scan it, is it sufficient to initial just the first page on the new Yes, table? yes. What's, what's the question? Well, do we have to do that electronically like we would any other court document, or are those still going to be accepted manually? I'm glad you asked. And, you know, it's such a bad question, she left. <laughs> We're, they're going to come back and hold that thought, and I'm going to make a note of it. That's really filing in the deed records. Yes, and... My understanding is that the mandate does not extend to deed record filing at this point, but, you know, they, they may or may not be set up for it. Craig. Uh, orders submitted electronically, Word Perfect and Word, or just Word? I prefer Word because I was a dedicated Word Perfect user for many years, and I got up to the county, and the county said, well, Judge, you can use anything you want, but we'll support you, like, you know, IT support, if you use Microsoft Word. We won't support you if you use WordPerfect. So I got to change. Back row. I'm the only one in our office that has a copy of WordPerfect. So if, if you just got to do it in WordPerfect, send it to Mark. <laughs> Y'all hear that? When you sign up with an EFSP and you're signing up a firm account, it's got a place to put in multiple email addresses so everybody can see what you're doing. Still have eight tracks? <laughs> I think those are dinosaurs. Um, you know, and the, and the district clerk has had a fax filing system for years. It is expressly disapproved in the new rules. Fax filing is just not part of it. It still, you, it still speaks to faxes under Rule 21A for serving notice. So I wouldn't, you know, if it's still working, I wouldn't pitch it.
what we need to do is to look at the rule that says what goes in the signature line, and I'm going to look that up. Question. Are y'all just numb on both ends? <laughs> okay, we're going to take how long a break? Ten minute break. Then we'll come back and have some Q&A with the clerks if you got any more questions. And then I want to talk to you about what is an iPad good for anyway? Yeah, for your grandson. All right. Some of you passive-aggressive lawyers came down here and asked the good questions where nobody else could hear you ask. I got some good ones. So I've, I've written them down, and uh, Arlene has got some. I'm going to let her start. Just address well, things you've already been given. I, I just want to – I have a question that came from a young lady over on – this side, I don't see her. What it was about, um, the, your one of your, your your bullets in your paper, Judge, that uh, talked about whether is she still here? Okay. The the question is, she was she was asking about whether uh, the where Judge King has in his paper that the uh, orders, proposed orders, should be in word format. Versus Adobe Acrobat, a searchable Adobe Acrobat. I said editable for me. Yes, yes. Okay. So that's that's the answer. She's, uh, I think she walked out. Word will convert Word Perfect files to Word so we can work with it. So I'm not worried about what you send me as long as it doesn't have bugs in it. Okay. And I, I just want to go back to secured attorney access. Um, our, the county clerk promised the Bar Association probate bar, pro, bar association attorneys about a year ago um, we came to you and said that we were going to open up attorney access to images uh, and Judge King talked a little bit about that. What we did not know that is in December of uh, we started working on that project on that initiative and in December of 2012 the Supreme Court came along with the e-filing mandate and we had to turn our attention to getting us ready for this uh, but that is still a commitment it's an initiative. As soon as we get past putting all of the infrastructure and the business processes in place for electronic e-filing, we will open up electronic or we will open up secured attorney access. And, and the way that we, we're thinking it's going to be designed is you as attorneys, you have a state bar number. Once you, you're going to have a, a form you're going to fill out with the clerk's office, it's your bar number, all your relevant information, and you will get an ID uh, log on information. Your own unique logon, and that will give you access to the portal, which is what we call public browse. Y'all are familiar with public browse where you go in now and you can see see the register of action and you can see a document, that, or at least the title of a document or that instrument. Now you will, when, when attorney access is turned on, you will see a little image next to that document. You will be able to click on that image. You can save it. You can, you know, download it, print it, whatever. Um, and we're looking for, to, for this to happen sometime in the first quarter of 2014, but after the mandatory go live uh, for e-filing. Yes. Uh, right now, simply attorneys. We are talking about um, if, a, if a law firm uh, has legal assistance, paralegals giving access at that level under the attorney's access code. So that's something we're looking at. Well, Just share your bar number with your legal assistant. <laughs> And also, one other thing I wanted to mention, we talked a lot about kiosks in the courthouse or kiosks in the clerk's office when you come in. Right now, we are planning to have about six public terminals where you can come and you can electronically file your documents. That is also predicated upon you bringing them in on a thumb drive or a flash drive and then uploading those documents. Right now, we are not planning to have scanners available. It is something we're looking at. We have to work through some, some security issues with IT, um, and we're hoping to be able to provide scanners. But right now, just the kiosks, 
you will have to have your documents on a thumb drive or a flash drive in order to use those kiosks when you come over. And the only other thing we wanted to note is, just like we asked you now, if you come in with documents filing last minute, please alert the clerks that you have an impending, you have a hearing that's going to be scheduled. We will not know. Your documents are going to be going to queues. We will not know that you have a hearing at 2 o'clock if you come in in the morning and file that document. So um, it, we, we're trying to work out those logistics as well. But please ensure that you alert the clerk, as you do now, I've got a hearing this afternoon or I've got an impending hearing and this needs to get to the court immediately. Okay? Yes. Yes, you may call. Also, there's a comment section, and you can comment. I, I, I don't remember off the top of my head what that looks like, but you can include some comments with your filing. Hey, you've got a hearing at, at, at 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock or whatever, or 11 o'clock. Um, but there is, a, there is a way that you can note on your filing that uh, there is an impending hearing. Yes? Um, for, for filing in actually in the clerk's office. Right now, what we're asking is, is that you c bring those in manually. Bring those in, physically walk those in. We do not, bless you, we have not worked out logis logistics for electronically filing those, but we are asking, I think Judge, Furch Judge King mentioned with, uh, with wheels, original wheels, to bring those in, walk those into the clerk's office. Okay? Yes? No, that is not changing. That's statutory. Okay. And I, I, somebody asked that question earlier. I believe if if it's filed by 11:59. If it's filed by midnight, it gets file marked that day. So, okay, so, so you can file. Yeah, you know, if you're trying the, the Thursday cutoff for 10 days, Monday next after 10 days, you can file up until the stroke of midnight uh -huh. on Wednesday night. And it'll still get that file marked date. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you need to write the cause number on the original will and, you know, either mail it or hand deliver it yeah. at the file desk in the clerk's office. Yeah. And when you get, when you f uh, file your application for probated will of whatever uh, your fi action you're filing uh, and you, f you include your scan copy, you will get your file, your cause number back. So you'll know your cause number by the time you bring in um, the, the original will. Now, if you intend to mail the original will in, don't let, don't don't think the mailbox rule is going to help you on the ten days. And the flip side of that is, if we don't have the physical will in our hands in ten days, your setting comes off, and it'll, you'll have to reset. And that's not, you know, that's not a huge sanction, but we've got to have something that that will ensure that we have a few days to look at that original will before the hearing. Question? Yes, so uh, if I was thinking about maybe contesting that will, I'm still going to have access to the physical document itself. So if I wanted to contest the will, I would have to go through As soon as we get it. Right. The question was, if I'm thinking about contesting the will, will I have access to it? As soon as we get it. It's not going to be in camera. Yes. Uh, sometimes uh, we need to be in a certain You, you can put it in the comment section, but it's also on that supplemental information sheet. There is a area there that says related case, and that would that'd be very helpful. Yeah. But if you know the cause number of, of, your, of your companion case, please note it. Please put it on there. That, that just helps us. Yes. We're going to override that. The clerk, if we know that there's a companion case or related case, and we we always run searches to to verify if there is a companion before we let it fall in another court, we can override that as we do now. We have that same business process. I'm sorry. The default 
It doesn't assign until the clerk approves it. So it doesn't automatically uh, assign your number when you upload your document or when you submit it to the clerks. It doesn't as assign a cause number until the clerk reviews and approves. So it may be four or five days before it comes back to me with the number so I can see the original list. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, once we review it and we see that there is a companion case, then we can make that adjustment on our side, and then that will be uh, sent back to you. You will see that that number has changed to that companion case court. So you'll get a confirmation on that, Carrie. Right. You, you're going to submit, I'm sorry, let me, let me finish addressing his question. When you submit your, your, your application for probate of will, you're going to have a scanned copy of, your, of the will submitted. So we will, uh, we will give that a cause number before you submit your, your, your original will or you turn over your original will. <laughs> yeah, and that's going to be almost immediate. We, we, we're looking at about a 24-hour turnaround if there is not a problem with the filing. So those will not sit in queues or will not sit um, unreviewed by the clerk for two or three days. I mean, our, our process is already we check for companion cases. Even if it's not on the supplemental sheet, it's just part of our process to make sure there's not any other um, case with the same decedent and, and companion cases as well. We do a thorough search. Question? Sometime Monday morning. Just kind of depends on what the volume is that's come in. You're not, you don't have somebody overnight or over the weekend or anything like that, correct? Unfortunately, we do not. <laughs> and I guess, is there any time limit? Is there, do the rules impose a time limit for the clerk to accept or reject the Not that I'm aware of. I'm going to defer to Judge King. Not yet. <laughs> yes. That's the easiest thing to do. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that that's correct. You could have it in a cover letter. You can put a sticky note on it. Uh, sticky notes are not a very good way to do it. <laughs> we, we would prefer a cover letter, not to, not, well, we yeah. would prefer a cover letter. We just, uh, or handwrite it on there, on the will. Did you say within 10 days? Have it in our hands within 10 days. Mark? No? Okay. Yes, sir. Maybe I missed this. If you're, if you're trying to get an order in, Editable. Is there a process as of December 1st? For we'll give you the email address to send it to. What's that? It, we will give you the email address. I can't speak for court two. It's going to be my staff attorney in, my, in court one. So you're going to be emailing those to the court. That's what the other lady was trying to get clarification on. They're going to go to directly to the court. You're, the last appendix in this are business processes. This is I mean, this is, and, and the top of it, it says discussion draft. <coughs> we haven't even had the discussion yet. <laughs> I'm just trying to put stuff out there to provoke discussion. And I would invite you to look at it. And if, you know, the kinds of questions that are coming in, and they're great, if you want to send us something to discuss <coughs> and to come up with a business process for, please do so. Because this is how it's going to how it's going to get promulgated. But, uh, you know, is all this going to be cast in stone December 1st? I doubt it. We're going to do it, as much of it that we can agree on as quickly as we can, and probably then put it on the court website or the clerk's website or both or link back and forth. Uh, we don't want anybody to be you know, working in the in a vacuum or in the dark. We're trying to get you as much information as we can, but we all have day jobs. Yes. Any additional questions? Yes.
but then do you also want us to email you? Don't have to. Don't have to. I'm saying we would prefer on, you know, it's not going to be across the board to get all the orders in Word or in editable form. When we have something that, you know, we don't know where the rocks are under the water, so we have to be careful where we step, sometimes we will want to take your order and, and change it. If it's an order approving inventory, chances are we're not going to be changing it. So, and if we need to, you know, we'll, we'll get that done. But uh, any more questions? Yes. I have a question. Um, so, when we're filing a new probate case, we were talking earlier about the civil information sheet or the information sheet and the supplemental sheet. Is that going to be something that we have to file, or is that going to be something that is set up through text file that we go in and fill out that information and submit? What we're hoping is is that. You will have two options. You can go to the court's website, go to the clerk's website, get those documents, a fillable document, and then include them. Uh, but what we're really, what we're hoping for now that I don't remember if it's in place with, within text file is that you can complete those documents within text file. Ideally, that's where we're trying to go. There's some variation even within the statutory probate courts. There's, there's the case cover sheet that's pretty much cast in stone you know carved in stone that's mandated by the OCA I get cussed out a lot by clerks in small counties because I'm, I was the architect of that <laughs> but uh, the supplemental cover sheet varies from county to county so Dallas County uses a different probate supplemental cover sheet than Tarrant County or Travis County or other counties. And so I, I would be surprised if text file is going to offer that many menu options. Hopefully they will. But otherwise, we will have a supplemental cover sheet fillable, downloadable on the court website, the clerk's website, <coughs> anywhere else we think it would do some good. Any more questions? Someone will be appointed as a, a, a guardian ad litem, say, and we initially get some documents that have been filed, an information letter or something. Will that still be paper, or is that going to come to us in a different format? Probably initially paper, although we're about to put the information letter on the website in a fillable PDF. And that's one of the business processes that we're looking at is to allow someone to electronically sign an information letter and since they're not, they're individuals they're they're SRLs they're not required to e-file then it may be transmitted by email to the court investigator I don't know yet so the answer is maybe it may it may be an electronic copy it may be a hard copy any more questions I've got a couple of questions, things that have been been asked. Um, can exhibits be submitted in landscape? Well, the rule does not speak to the orientation of the document. Um, I, th I think that if it if it's incomprehensible to do a spreadsheet in portrait and you print it out in landscape and you submit it in landscape. That does not violate the rule. Uh, the other question is, is it okay to have it non-searchable? Well, I think we're going to prefer everything to be searchable. And Adobe Acrobat will make just about anything with text on it searchable. Sometimes you'll get an error message where it, it won't make it searchable. Uh, I'm going to wait and see what the Supreme Court says before I you know, come down one way or the other for sure on that. And we're going to try and be as redemptive as possible as this rolls out. We're going to try and work with you as we we know there's going to be a lot of unintended consequences. Uh, but we also know that TextFile has done this in at least six other states. And so it's not like we're discovering America for the first time. Mm -hmm. Anything else?
Okay. Last thing I just want to leave you with is I know there has been a, some concern expressed uh, to Mary Louise Garcia and to myself and my staff uh, that you are going, that we're moving away from that human contact, face-to-face -face contact, um, and you're, you're concerned about the customer service. I want to guarantee you or to make a commitment to you that our the same level of quality customer service you receive today, you will continue to receive from the county clerk's office, and I'm certain, cer certainly sure from the courts as well. Uh, we will have staff, our staff will, 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 will try to at least refrain from so many emails or communicating problems and things that need to be changed initially by email and, and continue to pick up the phone and call you and say, can you do this, or just alert you to things that need to be done or redone. Um, so you have our commitment that we will provide the same level of customer service that we provide today. Yes. Yes, yes, good, great question that has not been asked or addressed. Right now, we, um, well, the way text file is currently set up or configured, uh, we have a, all of our various uh, documents and events out there. We're trying to make those selections as generic as possible, so kind of bundling, bun, bundling them, if you will. We're working on that, so your selection of documents will be uh, limited, and you won't get 900 or 700 hundred events where you're trying to select and then once the clerk brings those documents over into our case management system we will appropriately uh, categorize them or file them under the appropriate document name so we're trying to do that as much as possible uh, the same thing with our but we will have all of our case current case types out there and I think Jim wanted to talk a little bit about case types you want to do that real quickly uh, yes the, the case types are just going to be uh, you're filing your independent uh, Dependent, um, probate, other estate proceedings will be your muniment title, termination of airships. That will be your first step after choosing the Tarrant County on your location. Um, you would need to select the correct case type. From there, it goes into what you're kind of speaking about, event type. You will find, let's say, uh, muniment of title, and at that point, there's a fee that's tied to that. Okay, so you have your case type, you have your event type with the fee that's associated with that, and that will bring it into our case management system that way. And it's the same with your independents and dependents and small estates, guardianships, the same way. And, and even if you select the wrong event or the wrong title of the document, we're going to review those and we will make the corrections on those. Yes. Yes. There will not be, no, you pay one transaction fee. We're, we're talking to Tyler a little bit about how that works, and we're trying to work around those things, but that's a great question. Um, if you make a mistake right now, we're hoping that you will not be assessed an additional $2. The county just couldn't justify doing that. We would not want to do that. Yes, ma'am. That the rules the rules specifically speak to that and the FAQ from the clerk, if you'll look at what they have, it specifically speaks to that. We put a cover on letter and say this goes with cause number yeah. And if you're just gonna submit an order, you submit a cover letter saying there's just an order okay. as an original filing. It all changes January 1st. Okay. Well, and then you attach your exhibits as an attached document. I'm sure it'll be the same logic. Same logic. 
Different names. Yeah. For, for those of you who are using Texas.gov now for e-filing, you are aware that as of November 30th, they go away. They're, they will no longer be available. So if you are e-filing through Texas.gov now, you will have to select an electronic uh, filing service provider by that time. Thank you. Adobe is the developer for Acrobat, so it's the same. Nitro Primo is the same thing. That's correct. It's not two different applications. Okay. Judge, you're going to go with it. Thank you. <laughs> A couple of things that nobody's talked about and no one's going to talk about if I don't talk about it. Um, <clears throat> in Minnesota, they started about seven or eight years ago with one county having e-filing of all the probate reports, inventories and accountings and so forth. And it, was, it worked so well that in 2010 it became mandatory statewide. So all inventories, all guarding the person reports, all accountings, all final accountings are filed on a separate probate e-filing website. I, I've been in touch with these people and talking with them and talking to TextFile and talking to the uh, JCIT and the rules attorney for the Supreme Court because I think this would just be an amazingly good thing for Texas, particularly for the small counties where the courts don't have the staff that the statutory probate courts have. And so I have an agreement from TextFile to do a pilot project just on, on indigent guardians of the person. We tried to select something that would be the smallest slice possible, but that would be you know a good proof of concept. So. Um, those are people who don't have to have lawyers. So they already come under the waiver for filing fees and they'll have a fillable form to fill out. And uh, so anyway, because y'all may have heard that the self-represented litigant <coughs> rules in the district court uh, have been a little bumpy in their institution, TextFile is going to be working with them on building an engine to do that. So it's really the same software that we'll be looking at. And uh, you know, I'm hoping at some point in time that we might be able to have all the probate compliance filings statewide to be done since they'll all, within two years, they'll all be e-filed anyway, uh, to have a way that it can be done. And the important thing is that in Wise County and Young County, you know, in, in Jack County, they don't have the staff and they don't have any way to ensure compliance with the required filings that we do. I know a judge in South Texas that the lawyers are threatening to get someone to run against her because she is actually requiring people to file inventories. <laughs> well, we've never done it that way here. Well. You know, and, and people steal from people because no one's watching. So anyway, I'll quit, pre quit preaching. Uh, in the few, few minutes we have left, I have this hour and a half outline. <laughs> First time I gave this outline, we really did talk about it for an hour and a half. Uh, how many of y'all either have an iPad or wish you had an iPad not really not sure how you use it yet and you know or, or that you're using it but you just don't feel like you're utilizing it I want to address some of this I talked a little bit earlier about getting your toe in the water and I've, I've, I've tried to put you know as, as much on two pieces of paper as I could the first thing is uh, Tom Mile from Houston is probably the guru for iPad and law practice. And on the ABA website, you can get, he's now got three books out. There's iPad, and, well, I don't think he wrote the third one, but there's iPad and one lawyer for hours, iPad apps and one lawyer and one hour for lawyers, and now Adobe Acrobat and one hour for lawyers. I don't think you can read the book in one hour, so I'm not sure what the one hour is. 
There are also uh, presentations that you'll see from time to time, uh, mainly by a lawyer from New Orleans, and he did it at the Texas Bar Convention last year, does it at the ABA Convention every year for several years now, and it's called 60 Apps in 60 Minutes. Is there anybody that doesn't know what an app is? Okay. And so I would recommend those to you. It's a learning curve. Unfortunately, the learning curve is resilient, and it keeps going back up like this when you learn something. But you build on everything that you learn. Um, figure out what platform, you know, if, you, if you're just, you know, diehard Ford versus diehard Chevy, some people will not buy anything from Apple, fine. Android has a lot of stuff. There's some other people out there. And if you want to bet your future on which 8-track is going to survive, I, I just made a choice. I mean, I've, I've had issues with Apple. I had an Apple IIe and an Apple IIc back in the early 80s because I wasn't going to pay $6,000 for an IBM. And so I paid $2,000 each for those two little dinky computers that, you know, your phone is six times the computer. Figure out what you want to use. I really recommend the desktop scanner I was talking about. Beyond that, figure out how you're going to use it. Are you also going to listen to music? Are you going to watch movies? Are you going to read e-books? You know, how much, how much do you, memory do you need? There's a debate about whether the full-size iPad or the mini, which one is better for content creation versus content consumption. And anything I'm saying, if you Google it, you'll find more articles than you can read in a week about any of these points. But, you know, some people love to be able to carry their iPad mini and a mini wireless keyboard. And, you know, they, they're, they're drafting documents and they're, they're emailing back and forth. Then you got to figure out, you know, what kind of cover. Is it going to be something simple? Is it going to be something that folds up with the... Uh, keyboard in it. Uh, you're going to have to have another travel bag. There are uh, a lot of blogs about what's in your gear bag, just like there are blogs about what's on your home page, what apps do you use, how do you, uh, how do you arrange them to make it intuitive and easy. You know, you can have 256 apps, but if you don't have them in folders, it can take a while to find it. That's why there's a search utility in there. I got a, two full pages just on listings of apps, and I'm not going to talk about those unless someone's got a specific question. You know, I've got a dozen apps for, for note taking, and the question is are you taking the notes with the little keyboard or are you taking the notes with a stylus? You can get a fountain pen that has a stylus on the end of it so you can make notes. But what I've learned, no matter what you're using, practice it before you have to use it. More than once, I have, I have thought, okay, I'm all set. I downloaded all these apps, and I'm going to go into this meeting, and I'm going to make my notes. And I realized that I couldn't figure out how the app worked. <laughs> so, you know, most of these are free. Some of them, you know, the most expensive ones you'll find, other than something like TrialPad, which is 80 bucks. It's usually a couple of dollars, less than $10, almost always less than $5. I've got a listing of different blogs that I think that you ought to look at. Whether you subscribe to them or not, it's up to you. As I said, Techno Lawyer and iPhone JD are kind of the, the biggies. iPhone JD will, will cover everything about the iPad and the iPhone and how you use it, and you'll get emails once or twice a week just with links to, to new products. This guy's gotten well enough known that manufacturers are sending him stuff free if he'll talk about it, and he usually does. Uh, techno Lawyer, again, drinking from a fire hose. It's just, but it's amazing. Uh, I, I find two or three or four articles every week, and they're usually pretty short, and you go, yeah, I always wondered about that. And so it's, you know, things that are helpful. 
I've got some specific citations for some of these, uh, how people use them in trial, how people use them in meetings, how people use them in mediation. Uh, everyone's got their best idea of how it works. I'll, I'll leave it up to you to try some of them and figure out what your best idea is. In the five minutes we got left, I've got a list of what I thought are 10 processes that should be helpful to you. First is, how do you get your files onto your device? Um, Apple does not put a USB port in the side of their devices. So you have to use your computer, and then with your computer, and, and you know, the, the iPad, the, I, the tablet, the Android, is not a complete substitute for a computer. So you don't get rid of your computer because you've gotten a tablet. And the computer is what you use to put files on there. Now, you put files on there in a lot of different ways. You can use iTunes. Uh, my favorite way is to use Dropbox, which is cloud computing. It just means that there is a, a server where you put your files. When you set it up, it just appears as another drive on your computer. And you set it up on your desktop. You set it up on your laptop. You put it on your phone as an app. You put it on your iPad as an app. And then all those files are there no matter what platform you access them from. Now, the issue is how secure is that? Well, not at all, unless you make it secure. And Dropbox now offers two-factor authentication so that when you want to access something, you say, I want to access this, and it's like your bank when the bank says, we don't recognize this computer, where do you want us to send the access code? Do you want to send it by text to your, to your cell phone, by email to your phone or to your home, whatever email address you've got, and then they send you an access code so that you can then log on. So this keeps somebody else who just happens to know your email address from accessing your Dropbox. Now, if you're collaborating with somebody they don't have to have Dropbox. You can send them a link to a specific file or a specific folder. Uh, I, I work with law students in, in some writing projects, and so I send them access to the folder, and we do the drafts back and forth in that folder, and they send me an email saying, okay, I redid section so-and-so, then I can go in there and look at it and, and say that's fine or I want to make these changes. Great collaborative. You can share. If you've got files that are too big to email, you can put them in Dropbox and send somebody a link so they can get into that file and download that, you know, 27 megabyte file that Tarrant County won't let me email to somebody. Uh, data editing. Some people can, you know, if they can text real good with their thumbs, they, they're good with using the keyboard built into the tablet. Other people like to have the separate keyboard. I personally prefer the Apple wireless keyboard because it's, it's the same size keyboard as a Mac and the battery lasts a long, long time. There's just not a lot of things where it's all bundled into one, <coughs> one cover. We talked about uh, creating searchable PDFs. If you have PDFs and, and someone has sent you something to review and it's in a PDF, you can use Adobe Reader, which is free, or you can use PDF Pen or PDF Expert, and you can annotate searchable PDFs, or you can draw on and annotate and highlight and make notes on non-searchable PDFs. And again, none of that costs more than $5 a piece. Uh, signing PDFs, again, those same three things. Adobe Reader, which is free, now allows you to create a signature JPEG and you can edit it to your heart's content to where it looks just like your real signature if you want to. And then you can save that as a utility and sign documents and email them back to the office. Fillable forms can be created in Word. I prefer to do it in Adobe Acrobat. It is just stupid simple. You pull up a form, you create a PDF, and then you say, make this a fillable form, 
and it uses what it thinks is a smart way to do it, and then you go in and edit the fields that it's put in, and then you can send it to somebody and they can fill it out, or you can put it on a website for it to be filled out. Uh, presentations and mediation are in court. I didn't bring my bag of stuff, but you have to have a bag of stuff. Uh, it's like a PowerPoint presentation because you're going to have either your laptop or your iPad and then you have to have some way to get that data into a projector to project. With an iPad, you use Airport Express and Apple TV. I didn't put Apple TV in there, so Seven should have Apple TV as well. Each of those are going to cost you about 100 bucks. Um, no, it's not an inexpensive way to do it. It's a real good way to make your presentations. Uh, if you want to get fancy, you use Keynote because PowerPoint is, is, is not an Apple product, so they have an app called Keynote that takes PowerPoint and just directly uses it. And if you want to really have fun, you get Keynote Remote and use your iPhone as your remote for your iPad to run a slide pro presentation. Uh, if you've got this where you can set it up and just display directly from the iPad in a mediation or something, then you can cut out the, the uh, projector. Uh, Y'all know how to take a website and make it look like an app on your phone? You search for something in Google and you find Dallas-Fort Worth NOAA weather radar. That's not an app. It's a website. You open it in Safari and then it's got add to home screen you add it to your home screen and it comes up just like another little app icon so that you can it's a shortcut to a website instead of an app so if you've got somewhere you search repeatedly or you just want to see what the weather radar is as opposed to a weather app that's how you do that Evernote a lot of people run their entire law practice on Evernote Evernote is a cloud note-taking app where you can go in and set up notes, set up folders. Uh, you get two gig free. That's a lot of text. But you can also drop in music. You can drop in, if you've you got a sound file or recording, you can drop in photos. And look at Evernote. It's, uh, it's got a lot of other things that it works with, and they have a family of apps that all work together. Um, lastly, uh, look on YouTube, and there is a YouTube that a coach put on there on how to make a document camera out of your iPad, and you go to Home Depot, and you buy small uh, plastic tubing and slit it and, you know, and glue it all together, or you just order the thing that I've got the picture of here for $59. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Judge, and thank you to all of our participants today. Just a few quick announcements. We are videotaping this. We're going to try our best to have DVDs available if you'd like to pass them along to someone else or to someone in your office. We're also going to do our very best to either post it to our website or post a link to where we have put it on YouTube so that you can have access to that as well. I'd also like to make a suggestion to the court. We have a, a portal to all of you through our electronic newsletter. If you're not already signed up for that, um, please let us know and we can get you signed up for that. But that would be a good way to receive communications from the court as this is an evolving process. Thank you all so much for coming and have a great day. Thank you so much. We got you your three hours. You sure did. I can. And if anybody needs a signature on their paralegal certificate, you can bring them up here and I'll sign them.